it's an interesting dance that we have uh, with our egos, right? <clears throat> and I remember when we first had that uh, psychologist on on the show, Sal, that you brought. Oh yeah, and she assessed all of us. Yeah, I love her. And she really like uh, broke down like narcissism, and and that there's there's a healthy dose of it, it's a positive version, right? And then there's obviously an, an unhealthy uh, version of it. And so I think that you know in our space uh, with our peers as as you get uh, a larger audience and more people paying attention to you. There's that fine line that you have to constantly dance. And I think this is a conversation that uh, the four of us have a lot. And one of the things that I appreciate about these guys so much uh, that I think we all have in common is as that grows for us, um, instead of seeking it more or letting ourselves fall into it, uh, we actually want to kind of run away from it. We'd, we, we'd prefer to become more detached and not feed into it as much uh, because we want to stay grounded to your point that you brought up before we got on. Yeah. Yeah. I've, um, there's a, a quote or an idea that I heard from some basketball coach and the, the key to be the best player is to be good enough, know enough about the game to play the game well, but not so much to realize that the game doesn't matter. I feel like oh wow! I feel like a mm. lot of the this whole experience with that making like a, books or podcasts or social media or any of that stuff, you can be so deeply in the tunnel of the game. All that matters is is growth and more and numbers and quantities. Yeah, and then be certain back. things can happen in the world, such as what's happening right now, which I think has been immensely healthy for my own mind where I kind of drawn back and I'm like, I don't even know what the hell matters, Yeah, which mm -hmm. I think is perfectly healthy. It doesn't always feel great because a nice, healthy, inflated ego and puffed out chest <laughs> temporarily, it's right, like right. cocaine. Like while you're doing it, you're like, mm -hmm. this is, this is yeah. cool. Oh, well, what are they, what's then it? the effects mm -hmm. with long-term use, it's like, oh, that was problematic. Right. <laughs> yeah. what, there's another quote, like a bad day for the ego is a good day for the soul. Mm. You know? And I think that's, uh, I think that's super, super true. If you're back to the narcissist uh, testing that we did or whatever, it was part of this psychological uh, profile that we had done on us on air, which was kind of cool. She said, you have to have a, a certain dose of narcissism in order to go out and put yourself out there, right? So if you didn't think that you had something valuable and that maybe people would find what you have to say interesting, you would never put yourself out there in that way. You wouldn't go on media. You wouldn't promote yourself that way. But when it becomes unhealthy – is when you're no longer, you can no longer take criticism, you are the greatest, you're not open uh, to growth, and you can become very addicting. And like anything um, that you get addicted to, it can become very, very destructive. And the worst thing that I see, we've met many influencers, right? People with lots of followers and you know, in, in their space or whatever. And one thing that really struck me about some of these people is how conflicted and uh, how much in pain they seem to be because the persona that they have created mm -hmm. and that they're loved for is not their real persona. They're and, leading with their imposter and not uh, their authentic self. And it created, and it creates this, this turmoil within them. There was one person, I won't say their name, but one person in particular who presents themselves at this, as a super outgoing, charismatic, you know, talks to lots of people and girls and whatever. And this is part of their brand but in real life, they're one of the most shy, uh, introverted people. And he says it's, it feels uh, conflicting. It doesn't feel good because people love him, but they don't love him. They love the person that he becomes. And um, I don't think that's a good place to be. So when people ask about like social media and how do I build my business and what's important, I say, well, you know, this isn't going to guarantee success or failure. But try to be as real as possible because if you do get f popular – you at least won't be in hell. You'll be popular for being who you are and not for being someone you're not. Yeah. Well, it's just not sustainable, I think, is the big thing. No way. You know, and so it's it's like if you want – I mean, you can deceive people for a certain amount of time. There's some quote – around I, said, I, don't, I don't remember what it is exactly <laughs> was your first one dean you smith could, do you know who do you know who the coach was it sounded very no, dean I smith to, i got so many mm. yeah, uh, okay. i think it was pat riley yeah. stop it. <laughs> pat riley. this guy he just throws he like some because he's got greased hair yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, i know pat riley it's the only coach i know yeah, so yeah. just throw it out there what is what is the, this has nothing to do with what i was gonna say i just want to get to the bottom of what the idea was it's like you can fool all of the people sometimes and some of the people all the time or something but not all of the people all the time that was a totally separate idea has nothing to do with what i was gonna say um 
<laughs> so, I feel like but, you need a whole wall of quotes to, yeah. to refer to. <laughs> yeah, you can I have, have one at my house. That's what I do. Yeah, that's oh, why nice. I'm so quotatious. Mm. Anytime I hear something. <laughs> <laughs> you're just a wealth of it. Yeah, yeah, right. Right. Like a wealth. You know, you can pick yeah. your friends and you can pick your nose, but you can't pick your friend's nose. I think yeah. it's because I'm, sus- I'm suspicious of my own ideas. That's, that's an interesting mm, way to look at it. I think yeah. that's healthy. <laughs> I, I can be unhealthy, but I think that's healthy. Yeah. You know why? You just got to be careful, though. You're checking yourself. You just got to be careful because sometimes the quote sounds good out of context, and, to, and then you realize where it really came from, like a, Mar- a Marxism <laughs> quote that you, you posted not too long ago. I oh, still, that, that was so I'm good. I'm still in agreement. I think the, the four alienations makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. Beyond that, like right, I think right. it's a, it's one of those things where you there's a, a an individual, like you could say Adolf yeah. Hitler. Maybe yeah. he had a handful oh, of, of ideas. Course he, be like, nice to people. Of course Adolf he had Hitler. some powerful yeah. shit. There's or, no way that man tr- got to or Trump or yeah. like any people. It's like if you just we're very binary. We're very dualistic. It's yeah. like you're, you're either in, good, you're in the or bad. good or bad. Yes, mm. I got it on my cardboard sign. I put it out. Oh. It's you know it's, even it's, more so it's these days. Eight syllables and the boom. That's my point. Yeah. It's in a tweet, 280 characters, whatever mm-hmm. it is. Like that's my point, and yeah, that's yeah. the way that we communicate because we're trained by the the medium. And the medium is the massage. Is an interesting book all about this. Well, well we McLuhan. we have a uh, we have so we evolved obviously in tight uh, communities. So we knew everybody, um, and we evolved thinking of people along those lines. But then when you have media now, and the fact that we can know about a lot of people that we don't know. Where it's a little bit counter to how we evolved. So if I hear bad news and I'm in a tribe, right? So we're in a tribe of 15 or 30 people, which was most of human history. And I hear bad news, it's bad news because it's affecting me. Like there's a lion over there, killed three people. Yeah. Oh shit, I need to worry about that, right? So we still have that inside of us. But now I read something about something happening, you know, 100, 150 miles away or 1,000 miles away or 10,000 miles away. And it still has that effect on me. Like, I'm going to read about a story about a kid that got kidnapped and it's really terrible. Now I'm going to be really afraid that my kids are... They did this, uh, this great study. It's one of my favorites to, to, to talk about. You remember the movie Jaws? Of course. Right, great movie, right? When Jaws came out, they were doing polls and people genuinely thought... And this is because the news... Because of Jaws, news outlets reported rare shark attacks and it became like people would want to read about them, right? Because of Jaws. The perception was that shark attacks were going through the roof. Yeah. The reality is shark attacks have been about the same all the time. But people were all of a sudden very afraid of getting attacked by a shark when you're far more likely to die by slipping in the shower and, and hitting your head, for example. The same thing goes for the perception of safety. You ask anybody today, you ask anybody that's like Doug's generation or older and you say something like, is it more dangerous or less dangerous now for kids to be outside by themselves? Oh, Way safer than when I was a kid. Statistically, not true. Hmm. Statistically, the kidnappings and, and assault on children was far higher decades ago than it was uh, than it is uh, today. Today is far safer, but we perceive it as being so much more dangerous. And you know, uh, I'll take it back to our expertise, which is health and fitness. Uh, the way that we eat doesn't match the way that we evolved, and so we run into a lot of problems. The way that we move doesn't match the way that we evolved, so we run into a lot of problems. We created you know, a society where. Uh, you know, our desires to move less because uh, that made sense a long time ago. Conserve energy, don't injure yourself. Today doesn't make sense uh, to continue pushing that because eventually we'll be like the movie Wally. You ever watch Wally? No. The cartoon where they, the, the, the all, robot guy? Yeah, and the people are like. They're in, basically on like these rascal scooters on a, a, a one of the spaceships. It's like basically a cruise ship. Yeah, yeah and they're just, that's all they do. That's all they do is drink out of Slurpees. And they don't move. So they're like super <laughs> obese. Their bones got really small. Yeah, and, screens right in front of their eyes. Yeah, uh, and they don't look at each other. Like idiocracy. Yeah, there it is. It's, yeah, a lot like that. Yeah. Like yeah animated yeah. idiocracy. Exactly. So I don't know. Does it exist? So it's, it's always a problematic. It's a bad idea to bring up Hitler within like six minutes of any podcast. <laughs> oh, that's, that's Wow. Way too many times. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm curious if there is an instance with a human being where it actually is necessary and makes complete sense to destroy any idea or devalue any idea that ever possibly came out of that whole entire person's timeline mm. because of some evil shit they, they did along mm. the way. Um, is, is that a, is that a reasonable thing to, to to think? No, actually, I think you I think you have to be careful because somebody like Hitler, who I think is we could all agree in here, that was generally a pretty bad person. Yes, um, rough childhood. If you great salesman. <laughs> yeah, if you if you talk about ideas that he had or quotes that he had that may be valid, what ends up happening? I think the fear is, I should say. 
that you end up validating them in some way. And then people start to look at the other ideas and say, well, uh, these other ideas might be okay. And I think he meant it this way. You're like cracking the door. And not that way. And I think that's the fear. You know what I mean? You got that you have to kind of be careful. But I can see how there's how that also goes against reason. People are extremely complex. I mean, you have heroes of ours, for example. Uh, you might worship a celebrity or a past figure that did something really great. Right. And you don't and maybe you learn later on that they also you know, Do terrible things. Were philanderers or cheated on their wife or one time they abused someone or whatever. And it's like it conflicts with, you know, but I thought that they were all good. I'm like, no, they're human. They're complex. So they probably aren't all good. And somebody might not be all bad. Although I do think and historically there were, maybe are some characters that fit in that, that category. But for the most part, it doesn't. I mean, you know, I think I'm a good person. I don't think I'm all good. I guarantee you there's parts of me that are not good either. Yeah. You know? I've, I've been cursed it's been problematic for me that that my typical tendency is if i'm told not to think a thing my immediate <laughs> reaction is to go deeper into it which mm-hmm. i think is very common mm-hmm. um you know and so that was like we were talking about the history of cannabis before oh, yeah. this and it's a it's a really interesting example of we've had this institutionalized guilt and shame and you know all of these stereotypes of the idea that a person would that would vaporize this plant and Mm -hmm. maybe go for a hike or exercise or meditate or they have glaucoma or like any of the issues eating disorder and so that's been put into this bucket that it almost makes it be you know if you have a brand you're like oh can i talk about this Mm. plant you know because there's all this stigma around it Um, i think charged subjects like that oftentimes have um, deeply held meanings that are actually even more potent than the things that culture deems permissible, permissible for you to explore. Oh, uh, we, we, Adam and I used to talk about this all the time. You know, he worked in the cannabis industry. I have a very unique experience with cannabis, having helped somebody who fought cancer with it, having it help me with uh, with some health issues in the past. So I had a different perception. I remember him and I would talk about it, and we'd be like. You know, it's funny, you know, imagine you had a girlfriend, right? And you wanted to talk and you met their parents for the first time. And then you introduce yourself and they're like, hey, what do you do for a living, Sal? And they say, oh, I have a vineyard. You know, I, I make wine. Oh my God, what a great guy. He makes wine. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Now what if I said, oh, I, I, I grow marijuana plants and I, 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 you know, we provide that for all the dispensaries, you know? And oh my gosh, she's dating a, yeah. a guy. Drug grows, dealer. Yeah, Drug weed. Addict. Like that's crazy. Isn't that funny? Yeah. Have you d- discussed the the origin story of, of cannabis? Oh, early days. That was a big topic. We for talked. Us. Yeah, we talked a lot yeah. about cannabis. I want to go back to something you said though that I, I disagree with that it, it, in that you said you that uh, the practice of you know someone saying something uh, forces you to kind of go deeper or want to inspect it more, and that that's a common thing. That's actually not a common thing. It's a it's a trained skill that you've learned to apply that I think is very important. Uh, there's a really good book I talked about on the show a, a while back uh, called Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow. Oh, yeah. Uh, brilliant, brilliant man who wrote- Kahneman? Yeah, yes, yeah. yes. yes. Uh, Have you read that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. so that that skill is you, you, you've trained yourself to switch over to the second part of the brain where you think logically about something. And we're not wired that way. We're actually wired to take in information and react. Right. That's the faster part of the brain. Shortcuts. It's, yeah, it's more mm-hmm. advantageous for us. And it's important. It's important that we have that skill set to survive because if you stopped and you, you, you tried to unpack every single moment of your life, you would never get anywhere in your life. Yep. So there, there's value to that, that first part of the brain. But there's also it's also very important to know when you need to switch over to the other one and be like, wait a second, just because everyone's saying this or just because this is my initial reaction or they're saying don't do this, I'm going to th- I'm going to go deeper into it and think logically. So um, yeah, I don't think it's as common as you think. I think more people are easily uh, you know persuaded by the the first part of their brain that is just a quick reaction. And it's a practice that more of us, uh, including myself, have to constantly be trying to think like, okay, is this something that I'm just going to take at face value and react? Mm -hmm. Or should I go deeper into this and look more into it, even if the majority is saying otherwise? Yeah. You guys have heard the idea that our conscious mind is able to perceive something like 40 bits of information and then our unconscious mind is something like 40 million bits of information. Mm -hmm. And so we're always to, to kind of bring it onto a subject in relation to like body and movement and fitness and all that. 
Not that that's necessary. We don't need to talk about any of that stuff. But we're continually doing that from a, a body language perspective. Right. You know, so when you see somebody, there's an interesting some interesting research that I included uh, in my book uh, about when you if you would take a, a mugger and show them a bunch of different pictures of various different people, you'd think the common tendency would be, and they actually did this. They went into prisons and people that had violent crimes. Uh, you'd think the common tendency would be just like, okay, I mug this small, vulnerable, defenseless, person. vulnerable chick. Mm-hmm. Yeah, probably. You know, and it's like, no, no, no. The person that they would be the high, the highest likelihood of trying to trying to, to to mug, to steal from them, to be a parasite and attach onto them, would be the person that has um, their movement doesn't seem integrated. So if they're kind of like they're they're it, it doesn't seem like they're going in a straight line. It doesn't seem like they're well oriented. Doesn't seem like they're oh interesting you know, stacked and strong. It doesn't seem like they know where they are. Mm. So if they're looking around and there's like any semblance of disorientation or disorganization with that person, then all of a sudden the, the parasites of culture will start to, to grab on because oh, wow. it's because it's an easy it's target. It's like finding prey. Yeah. It's finding prey. And so we're continually doing that with our, I think our, our 40 million bits of information that's, that's streaming through our minds. I think we're continually doing that in every instance. Every time you have an interaction with any person, you are noticing the location of their eyes or eyebrows. You're noticing mm-hmm. the, the style in which they breathe or don't breathe. You're noticing the positioning of their shoulders. You're noticing the position of their hips, of their feet. You know, and so we're always in this, just we're having this plethora of information. And then you have your 40 bits that's like thinking about checking your Instagram notifications. Yeah. But meanwhile, you have this mammalian reptilian center that's just gathering all of that information. And by going through things like starting to pay attention to how the hell you move in daily life, I think you can start creating successes in your world and you don't even know what's going on. It's just like, oh, when I come into the room, people kind of are like more magnetized. Yeah, yeah. You know, or when I come into the room like this, people are more like, oh, that guy's a loser wow. or we the, should steal from him or. The math of that is so fascinating to me, right? Like the, mm-hmm. what your brain is having to calculate to put that all together. Now, yeah. so I like what a cool conversation because. Um, I have this where I, because of this stuff, I'm, I'm into psychology. You're more on the movement side. So it's interesting to see how they merge. Do you have, uh, because of you are so read in this, this department, right. And you enjoy learning about it so much. Do you have tendencies like right away? Like we just, we, you walked in, you know, 30 minutes ago and we all said hi and greet each other. Do you have a tendency to, to read? The, scan the room. Yes, yeah, scan the room and read each one of our postures right away. Is that, or does that just subconsciously happen for you? Well, ideally you'd get to a point with any skill that you'd be unconsciously competent. Yeah. You guys are familiar with that probably. Like mm-hmm. you yeah. start off consciously uncompetent ideally, mm-hmm. and then you, you know, works your way Four up the ranks until, until eventually you get to the point where you're just, you just naturally are, you know, like MJ, you just, you know, you do something with the ball, you just see the scenario. I'm not at all like MJ with anything, including <laughs> body language, but nonetheless, he gets that point. He's never thinking about what he's right, doing. Right. Um, you know, so anytime there's a, you know, I, there's a whole slew of different books that I'd recommend for uh, reading body language. Um, you know, my book has a lot of stuff in there, but there's, if I'm, if I'm reading a specific book about the thing, I will notice all that stuff. I personally haven't read a specific book about that thing for like six months. Yeah. Uh, so it's that's disengaged. Now I'm thinking about more, you know, like uh, Russia and conspiracy theories. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, please. <laughs> please <laughs> in. Oh, please, God. Please, but God. I don't want to talk about don't, that. Don't get, don't get me and Sal going. Yes. I like, I wrestle with these guys every day on the podcast right now because I think conspiracy theories are, are at an all time high in our life. Everything is. Yeah. Well, I mean, you mentioned reptiles. Everything's fair game right now. Yeah. Let's yeah. be honest. Yeah, I mean, it's, reptiles do run the world. You know, oh, yeah. 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 These guys themselves. Right. Oh. No, I, aliens children. are coming next. Yeah. Yeah, this no, is all happening. We're, we're, you know, you guys were talking about fast and slow thinking. One of the best ways uh, that I found to slow my thinking down, there's two ways. One is to debate and discuss because in order to organize your thoughts enough to explain yourself well and then be able to listen because you also in order to debate you have to listen right listen to the other person it allows you to work things out so i love thinking like this i love talking to people i love debating people not because i'm you know people some people might say oh you just like to argue the reality is that it helps me think and i can think things through the other way is the right mm-hmm. when you write things down you have to slow down 
and put things down. And that's why therapy utilizes mm -hmm. uh, reading and speaking, or excuse me, writing and speaking. Those two tools are very powerful to slow the thought process down and to work things out. It's literally what you're doing. Right oh, now. I have another exercise for you, and that is to is to always question the things you feel most strongly about. Yeah. And that to me is what is one of the most challenging because when you th start to unpack like how the brain is operating with the fast and the slow part, you know, m much of the things that you've decided that this is my truth, it's just because you've had a collection of things that have confirmed your bias yep. and so you feel passionately about it. So a great exercise to to challenge that or to work on the logical side is to if I feel pa so whenever I catch myself in a debate or an argument or a conversation where I'm getting uh, emotional about it or reacting or feel strongly about it, like the, I'm already stay, defending myself before you finish your sentence. Those are the things that I go back and go really deep in on because it's like, okay, why do I feel so passionate about I'm right in this situation? And I think that's really challenging for us because you've already had enough things in your life that have happened that have confirmed that bias, that it's going to be really hard for you to change your mind unless you're open to it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why it's one of the reasons why I love fitness so much. Um, not I love it for me, but I loved it more for when I trained other people for that particular reason because as a trainer, you know, I, I trained people for over 20 years and I really wanted to help people. You know, I, I know you do the same, Aaron, when you, when you work with people. Your concern is you want to make sure this person – does the best. You want to set them up to be able to do the best for themselves on their own, well beyond, maybe forever, right? When you don't see them anymore. So if you're constantly working towards that, you end up questioning things as you go through the process. You have to, because I'll work with this many people who the my techniques and my recommendations work great with, but then I run into somebody that they just don't. And if I really want to help them, I can't be dogmatic. I can't. It's impossible. I have to question things. And so it, it, it forces you to grow. And fitness is such a great uh, way to do it because it's uh, unassuming and it's not threatening. Yep. You know what I mean? People don't go into fitness thinking they're, gonna Im they're going to uh, experience tremendous personal growth in all things. They don't think that. They think, I'm going to go get ripped and I'm going to get a nice six pack and I'm going to look sexy or whatever. But you stay at it long enough and you learn a lot about yourself. You also learn how to fail. You learn how to take criticism. You learn that pain isn't always bad and struggle is many times good. Um, but the growth that comes from fitness is phenomenal. Nobody talks about it, but that I think is the biggest, the biggest benefit of it. Well, fitness also makes the, the, the human that's, that's doing the fitness more malleable to new ideas. Totally. And so when you like our, I'm just, we can talk about anything and I'll just like steer it back to how it relates to, to the mind body connection because yeah. that's like where I'm, I'm most comfortable beyond that. I just, I don't know, you know, I get, I get lost very easily. If it's not, if it's <laughs> yeah. not about that specific conversation. Smart, stay in your lane. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that enough during BLM and coronavirus, stay in your lane. And I'm like, all right. All right. <laughs> Lane's over here. Yeah. Hey, let's work on shoulder mobility <laughs> today. Shoulder mobility is. Yeah. What do you think about Russia? Shoulder mobility. <laughs> yeah. 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 But so a couple things. One, in relation to arguments, that's kind of fascinating. You guys can just bounce off this as, as if it feels interesting. When we're communicating with each other, um, typically I don't know a lot about the argument at hand because I just I'm just confused what the hell's happening in the world. But what I can see is I can see body language mm. and the way that people communicate. You know, and so you can, and that's that's why you know you see like like a Martin Luther King giving a speech compared to like I don't know some present day politician because I don't mm. want to be you know biased in any direction. Um, he goes off of the speech. And speaks through his heart, and it's you can see it in you his body, it. and it's like, oh, it's like whoa, you, you viscerally feel that experience because you're feeling him, you know. And so when we're communicating to each other, if you are a person that is, say, chronically stuck in some, you know, hyperlordotic spine, or you have you've got the for, the uh, forward head posture, you got rolled forward shoulders, mm -hmm. you got valgus collapsed knees, all of those patterns. I'm intentionally using unnecessary anatomical terminology because there's a direct link in the way that people think, feel, and communicate. Totally. Based off of that, those anatomical terms. Totally. And so an ex an interesting example of that is a person that goes into a a shopping mall. Is another reference from the book. They when they are pushing a cart. Uh, so says research with, you know, specific 
specific subject. So, you know, I don't think anything's a law. Um, but when a person is pushing a cart, so they're in a more upright position, shoulders are back, you know, and they're also pushing the cart away from them, they will end up being uh, less inclined to get sugary bullshit. Mm. And when a person is is clutching a basket, all of a sudden puts them into that medial rotated spine, puts them into that clawing kind of flexors contracting with the, with the hand, um, they will end up being more likely to buy fascinating fast. Yeah. To buy so shop with shop with shopping buy. carts, not baskets. And the similar thing <laughs> happens, similar thing happens for people that have, have storefronts of some sort. If you pull the door open, that puts you into the more inclined towards, okay, I'm bringing in. If I'm pushing the door away, I'm more inclined to say, I'm okay. I'm pushing. I'm, I'm starting the conversation with push away. Yeah. And so when I move into that, all of those little subtle, again, this is those, that 40 million bits, every subtle little action throughout the day starts to inform the way that we perceive the room, ourselves, this conversation. And so if you're a person that is stuck in that, you know, all the terms, forward head posture and having, you know, the hunchback spine, all that stuff, perhaps your tendency would be you'd have a higher inclination of being more defensive. Or maybe feeling like you're under attack and you are, you know, you're already defeated, you know, and versus the person that's able, like, before they go into a conversation, they wiggle out their shoulders, maybe they hang from a bar and they kind of, maybe they do like a little dance and kind of open themselves up a little bit. Maybe they write in cursive, which is, you know, shown to have all sorts of great effects as well, because you're going through that fluid movement. Mm. Um, they will go into that conversation much more fluid, much more open, much more receptive, much less judgmental, much less mm. defensive. You know, it's I always feel like a Jedi opening the automatic doors. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm ready to I need express my power. I need something humorous after that. You I know, appreciate that. You know what? You want, good, perfect. You want, to know, you want to know an area I would love for you to, 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 to read and learn about, uh, Aaron, because you this is an area that you have a lot of interest in and expertise in, yeah. in terms of how movement affects mood and thoughts and vice versa, how your thoughts and mood affect movement, look into, and this was a very fascinating point that was made in a podcast that we did a while ago, look into religious practices. Mm. I We interviewed um, Bishop Barron, who's a, is a Catholic bishop, and one of the questions I had for him was, what's up with all the, you know, I grew up Catholic, right? So um, you, you go to church, the Catholic church, and there's all this standing, sitting, kneeling, moving, all this ritualistic movement, and I said, What's up with that? Like, why kneel on the ground to pray? Why do all these different things? And I thought, you know, to myself, to somebody who's not uh, privy to it, I thought, it's, you know, it's all traditional, ritualistic, whatever. Why do we, why even do that? Yeah. And he said, I thought it was very wise, um, it's how you integrate the body. Yeah. All the movement is how you integrate the body, which allows you to, in, in their words, integrate the soul. And being a fitness uh, expert, I thought, oh my gosh, that's brilliant. There's a lot of wisdom in spiritual practices and in the, the culture of movement that they have. And every single one of them has different movements and practices that they do that are very characteristic of that particular religion. That's the value. People were tapping into that before they knew anything about any of these studies that you yeah. are talking about. It also links you into, so it does a handful of things um, and probably more than, more than what I've picked up. But another one is it moving in synchrony with any group of people, i.e. like a military marching. Oh, right. You know, so if you if you see the, the, the march and everyone's legs go at the same time or you go to a, a Taibo class or some kind of aerobic class mm. or any of that stuff, the reason that those cultures or sometimes cults get so big and powerful is because you're extending the the organism beyond the individual. Mm. And so you start to become in sync with other just by witnessing your movement happen in tandem. And so when you go into that that church, what you're doing is you're connecting with beyond your lonely, isolated, individualistic Group self, four. and you're going into something bigger than you. Well, you're quite literally, from a neurological perspective, an emotional perspective, becoming the group, you know, because we're all moving together. And then, you know, beyond that, I think if you get more spiritual about it, you know, the group is, you know, a part of the, the grander community, is a part of the country, is a part of the world, mm -hmm. is a part of everything. And then eventually you have this where you pop out of I 
you know, and you go into something that's, that's, that's mm. bigger than just this skin bag. Mm. And by moving in synchrony, it creates the potential to feel like you're starting to almost like merge with something bigger than your individual skin bag. I have a question for you, Aaron, because now that we're talking about this, there's, there's a question that I, uh, I, I've wanted to ask you for a little while. Um, what I worked, uh, I used to have a wellness facility and in there I had uh, like rooms that people would rent and there was this uh, massage therapist who worked there and rented the space for a long time. And she was exceptional. She was very, very good at what she did. And she used to say that, and I, when I first got the wellness facility, I was at least open enough to bring different modalities in and respect them, but I still was extremely ignorant to what they did. So she would say things to me and I'd, you know, I wouldn't roll my eyes in front of her. I don't want to disrespect her, but when she wasn't in the room, I think, oh, whatever, you know, that's her thing. That's fine. People like it, but whatever. And she would th- say things to me like people store emotions in their body. And I remember thinking, that's so silly. Like, it's in your brain. What are you talking about? It's not in your body. Mm. And then she would talk more about it and how she would find a tight area in a person's body and she would work through it, release it, and the person would have a memory uh, that was stored within them or a feeling that they hadn't processed and they would cry on the table or they would laugh or they would get this. And I experienced some stuff like that when she would work on me. What's going on there? And I do believe now that, that that emotions can be stored in the body in the sense that you create a pattern. That pattern may be, may be pr- protecting you or whatever from this particular thought. And until you fix that pattern. I've heard that with fascia. Yeah, you don't, well. you, don't, yeah. You, don't, you don't process the, 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 the emotion. What, what are your thoughts on that? So that would be subject of potential book two because that's I think that's like a topic that a person could spend their whole entire life digging into and still not completely understand it. Um, but the lens that I take from the way that emotions and such are stored in the body is less of a, you know, you have anger in your liver and you have mother issues in your kidney and Mm. like very specific in that way. Uh, and more coming back to very nuts and bolts, masculine, mechanical. If a person is scared, how are they scared? Right. How are they physically scared? And how's their body? Everybody, everybody yeah. knows what that looks like. I don't need to describe. Your shoulders go up. Your jaw might clench. Mm-hmm. Or maybe your wrist clench. You go into like a fight, flight type response, mm-hmm. or you could go into a freeze response, which is you know even deeper down the chain. Um, you know, so if a person is, so every day you are continually aggregating various different patterns based off of your perception of the way that you interact with the world. You know, so you have a certain like. You could call it like an identity of self, you know, which is something that, you know, you, you, how old is your kid, Sal? Uh, my, my son's 15, my daughter's 10. Okay. So yeah. you had, you got to experience, do you guys have kids as well? Yeah. We all do now. Yeah. I have, yes. a, I have oh, a 10 and seven, yeah. one year old. Two boys. This is the dad crew. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Dad trying to make dads cool again. That's exciting. Dilfs. Yeah. yeah dilfs. It's that's, dilfs. That's, that's great. I'm dating a girl that's all about dilfs. Oh, oh, oh nice. you're like, gonna have a kid better, now. Better get <laughs> I feel like she's trying to sell you on. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Careful. Right. Yeah. Um, what was I talking? About? I subscribed. Oh, to yeah, yeah. So, so the identity of self, identity of yeah, self. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so when you are, this happened last time. Remember the trees? I got yeah. lost in the woods. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the identity, the identity of self. Um, that's something that you, it, when you first come out, these are tangential points. When you first come out into the world as a baby, you are your mom. Mm. You know, so the umbilical cord gets cut, but you're like, what are you talking about? I'm like, I'm still mom. Mm -hmm. You know, so if I'm hungry, mom's hungry. You know, if I'm thirsty, mom's thirsty. Like you just, there's no separation. Sure. And then eventually you come into a point, which I think that's what they, they, they allude to being like the terrible twos, where you're starting to get that rip. You're like, oh, I'm separate. You're asserting yourself in that way too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. So, you, so, so that's 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 interesting. Mm-hmm. And then from that point forward, perhaps you know a little before or after, you're starting to structure this this story, this narrative of who you believe you are. You know, and so zero to seven, you're predominantly in like a theta state. It starts off delta for the first two years, and then you go into this theta, which is essentially like a hypnotic state. You know, and you're just gathering information like a sponge everywhere you go. You're developing these belief systems of who you are that impacts the way that you move in your body. You know, so if you are a person that's like, man, I feel great and I feel loved. I feel part of something bigger than myself. You know, so people that are part of religions or married, you know, they end up having longer lifelines mm-hmm. and they end up, you know, being a little bit happier and all that. It's like, wow, man, I just feel oh man, I feel good. I feel like I feel in my body. I feel at home in myself. That person's probably going to have more balanced blood sugar and blood pressure and probably less 
tension being held in their body. Less chronic pain, right? Less chronic pain, all that stuff, yeah. And then there's perhaps another person, obviously there's like tens of thousands of different kind of types throughout this, but on the other scale, it'd be somebody that perhaps they had some big, pivotal, traumatic moment, for example, that all of a sudden they got the signal, and maybe it was like before that age seven time frame where they're just kind of gathering, and they got the signal that the world is, is not safe. Um, the, the floor could fall at any time. Um, you know, I need to bulk up. I need to muscle up. I need to get strong and protected and show superficially that I'm, I'm good enough. I'm loved and all those things. Uh, maybe my shoulders are chronically stuck up in this position where it feels like my, my shoulders are kind of creeping up to my ears. Maybe my fists are chronically tight. Maybe I have, you know, this TMJ and my jaws are, uh, you know, and you could isolate that and look at it like more like Western scalpel type, type lens and go and isolate and say, oh, you just got TMJ. You know, you just have some tension up here. We're going to do some MFR or whatever. We'll release that stuff. Um, in the process, whatever tool you utilize in order to start to open up that body, in order to create meaningful long-term change, you're going to actually start tinkering into that person's uh, identity structure. You know, and so if you bring a person that's in a place of, I've been held and tense and ready to fight, and I have this physical expression of that, and you start to creep in and start to change some of those those toggles and pulleys that all of a sudden the person gets up and their their shoulders drop mm. and they're breathing through their their diaphragm as opposed to up into their clavicles and they're, they're they feel like their feet are on the ground you better believe that that person will start to interact with their relationships differently i see this with rolfing body work like i mean i've seen it Lots and lots of times historically working with people. Oh, I, I remember hearing, mm. uh, especially female clients would say the following, that that them getting stronger in the gym made them feel stronger and more confident yep. in the real world. And, it, and I mean, they're not like way stronger. They may be 10 pounds on something. But the experience of strength and struggle and grinding through a squat or a lift yep. made them feel uh, just generally stronger and more confident. Yep. In everyday experience. So we, we've we only known Aaron as Aaron of a line, and you've already, we were already this guy like that was into all this. So was there a process for you where this really, uh, you know, like a pivotal moment where you started to see this in yourself and you started to change, you yeah. know, behaviors and movement? And then how did it impact you? Was that, was that a process? Was it an overnight thing? What was it like for you for that transition? I think I think I've, I've talked about this before. I mentioned in the first chapter of the book, my um, dad. He's done very well now, but growing up, uh, he got really obsessed with with crack cocaine, and he was like pimping women, and he'd come home and have like bullet holes in the car, and it was like wow, very interesting time. Did I mention that before? No, I don't no. think you mentioned. It, no, sure. I knew you had a rougher childhood, yeah. and I and I feel even more like a bitch talking about my rough childhood when you talk about <laughs> things like that because yeah, no, mine doesn't seem so bad I was anymore. Fine. I was fine overall, <laughs> you know. But I think that that created this this stimulus of sorts of feeling like the world's not safe. The floor could fall out from on you at any point. Um, you know, going into much more of um, kind of just like clinging in general. You know, feeling like, like I, I would always have like savings of money and I was just like always planning for a rainy day, you know, and I think that in tandem with um, being obsessed with bodybuilding, be obsessed with packing on as much muscle as I possibly could, all because I wanted to show that I was strong enough. I think there was a big thing of like being enough um, that would get into probably sensations of like, oh, why did daddy leave me? Oh, because I'm not enough. Right, right. You know, so I think as a young person, it's you're you're so narcissistic. Everything's like kind of about you, right? You know, and so now with social media, everybody's kind of narcissistic. But but, <laughs> but I think growing up, it's like okay, dad's just on his trip. You know, he had his own childhood trauma and all of this stuff, and you know, I place that on me. So there's kind of this sense of like moving away, um, and then that kind of led to just doing everything to kind of create senses of validation, and so that. that going into doing personal training and then eventually going to like rolfing school and massage school and studying psychology and um, psychedelics, I think have been, uh, you know, impactful mm -hmm. for sure of kind of un unbinding some, some different nodes in my brain and kind of like pulling the map out and saying, okay, like, where are we here? You know, and then coming back and kind of folding the map back up and putting it back in. Um, you know, so I think it's been an evolution of different events uh, mixed with the environmental conditions of, you know, the world's not safe. And, you know, now here we are, you know, talking about it. No, I, I definitely think that we, we are obviously a product of our, our childhood and even as, as older mature adults still dealing with many of these 
insecurities uh, from childhood. Uh, do though? Do you have a particular one that tends to resurface in your life that you're constantly having to address because of how you grew up? Um, well, I think that I mean you can see a lot of people that have a lot of things, you know, or you know, I obviously to some degree crave validation, or I wouldn't, you know, put images of myself doing exercises on Instagram. You know, and it's, you can say it's, oh, it's just a business. I need to feed myself. But nonetheless, like I, I chose that route of look at me. I can help you. I can be your savior in a sense. You could see, right, you right. keep on drawing back and giving. I'm not saying that that is why I do anything, but you could certainly kind of, you know, toss that dart at the board and be like, how does that feel? Is there something to right, that right. of like how you got to that point? So people that have a lot of wealth, people that have a lot of followers on the internet, whatever, I think, um, you know, a lot of that could be drawn back to their seeking some form of validation from the outside world. This was a conversation that Katrina and I had literally last night and we were kind of going back and forth uh, with our own insecurities that we see. And one of the things I said to her that, that I've kind of come full circle on it, because I think that there is, there is a, a, a positive side to them also. Mm -hmm. If you, if used to fuel, fuel yourself to grow and be a better person. And then there's a, a very fine line of not, allowing it to rear its head. And do you find, do you agree with that? Or do you, do you think that yeah. like, you know, any sort of motivation from insecurity is, is bad. And I'll give you an example, like, so give people context of what we were talking about last night. So, uh, you know, I've been, I've been fascinated with, uh, real estate and since I was in my early twenties and, you know, I've read, I read several books in my twenties, even more so now as I've gotten older and, you know, uh, Katrina's family, there was times where they were, you know, refinancing their house or trying to make decisions. And I felt like I had the answers for them and nobody asked me and it bothered me. And so I told Katrina, I said, it's I, here. I'm trying to figure out why does that bother me? And then I also have noticed that there's patterns like this in my life where if, uh, people don't think that I'm smart enough in an area, yeah. Uh, it's also motivated me to go and learn and be smarter and be better at that. So I get that attention that they recognize like, oh shit, this dude knows his stuff in that area. And I think a lot of that, although fueled by insecurity has also driven me to success. So where is the, where's the fine line of allowing it to, to drive you to be better, but then not letting it control you and consume you to make bad decisions. Do you think about that? Totally. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think you could come back to, you know, Ram Dass or like Alan Watts or any like the spiritual people, you know, coming into the witness part of yourself. Like the more often that you can tap into the witness part of yourself, the less you are just being kind of tossed around. Like I imagine mm -hmm. like a rag doll in a dog's mouth, just kind of like getting wiggled around by that person loves me. That person doesn't like me. You like you become the stock market essentially. So any, relatively decent investor You're just reactive to yeah, everything you, you wouldn't be like dude don't even look at it today like let's check in on this in 10 years you know and then you still like wow you've really grown over the last 10 years wow you no know, but that takes a savvy investor to be able to kind of give you that education of like let's just kind of go more in the overview and be able to witness as opposed to being completely stuck on each individual person's reaction. To I you. love thinking of it like that because that this was the great, and, and I love having these deep conversations with Katrina because she's she's very self-aware and we, we, we like to do this where we'll go back and have these healthy debates. And the, the point I was trying to make to her is that I think that, and this you, you just validated that, is that the real important thing is the awareness piece, is to know that. Like, I didn't react. Like, it's not like uh, her mom didn't ask me advice and then I was a dick or I was just, or I tried to force my information on it. Yeah. I just observed that it made me feel a certain way and then motivated me to want to learn or do something more in that area. So I'm aware that there's work to be done inside and I have an insecurity there, but I'm also aware enough to not allow it to you know, change my mood or just react to it. Yeah. Uh, so, and I was like, so I don't totally think that uh, being motivated by some of these things are all negative. I think that no. there, if you, and I like what you just said, and I, I think that's true. Like if you are, are more of a witness of it and paying attention versus uh, just uh, like the stock market reacting to, you know, at oh, things all the time. It's your, your, your situation in, in your context can make you uh, a, a much better um, person. Challenge is what makes you grow. Um, it's like that. There was a wrestler. He had no legs. I forgot his name. And he was... Uh, he did Black very, guy lives in LA. I think so. And he did very, very well. 
and he did very very well for himself. And he talks about how um, if that if he didn't have that if he wasn't born in that situation, he probably wouldn't have been as great as he was. But it drove him to grow and be this incredible person. There's another person who's another disabled individual who climbed, uh, I think it was Mount Everest, and he said the same thing. I, I don't know if I would have done this had I not uh, had this particular um, challenge. So I think you're presented with your challenges, and it's up to you how, how you, you use how them. You have, yeah. Does it break you? Does it crush you? Or does it m- make you a better person? Um, and so in that way, your mindset makes all the difference. This is a gift versus... I'm cursed. That's all in your in your perception. You know, you you were talking about how you feel and your emotions and how that affects your body. Can you reverse engineer that in the sense that you know d- does it go both ways? In other words, yeah. the way I feel on the inside affects how I look on the outside. Can I change my body and then affect how I feel on the inside? Yeah. Well, so so Zion, we 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 pulled up that I've actually got to train jujitsu with Zion. No, wow. Yeah, super super interesting. So I, I never. Uh, that was the first time getting to to roll with a. What would that be called? A, a amputee? What's a, oh he, yeah. His legs are gone from like the mm-hmm. femur down. What is that called? Is that I don't know. Term? But he just anyway. yeah yeah. So bo- it's like chicken or the egg. You know. Mm-hmm. So so it's like what is the answer? I mean I think it's 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 both. You know, it just really depends on on the scenario. You know, so all of the stuff, you, your perception of yourself impacts the way that you carry your movement. Um, and then right back to the other side, you can move yourself into feeling a certain way. You know, so you could look at that from like the, the postural perspectives is, is one lens. But you could even say just like, you know, your your muscular system, it's like an endocrine organ. You know, so it's releasing hormones and proteins and myokines and, you know, irisin is like the exercise hormone that's helpful with thermoregulation and helpful with burning fat. And, you know, they compare exercise to, to being as effective or potentially more effective to, uh, to antidepressants. That's beyond my scope if you even have an opinion, um, you know, but it literally informs the way that you think, the way that you feel. Like anybody knows, listening to this, certainly, that if you're feeling kind of shitty and you go do a workout with some friends, afterward you're like, what happened? Oh, 100%. Like, what was that? 100%. And you're like, well, it was a lot of things, man. It was community. I'm connected to something bigger than myself. It was exercising and flexing and pumping this endocrine organ, the organ that we call muscle, slash massaging all of the rest of your organs. Um, it was uh, moving yourself through postural patterns that if you get into like research from Amy Cuddy is an interesting example, which is very contentious. Um, you know, the Harvard researcher, the whole, you, you guys are familiar with this probably, right? No. So Amy Cuddy, you will as I start talking about it. So, so she, was, she was the one that studied people going into like the the power woman position oh power, power, postures. power pose and all that yeah, stuff yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah and so there was i mentioned that in the book as well and, and as well as the contention around it it's interesting creating a, a book because it feels finalized hmm. you know when you put something down in the, in the book it's there you're like this is this is i'm i'm really saying something yeah. <laughs> you know whereas when you're writing an instagram post in your toilet yes. you know and you're like you're yeah. just your this hair's not done this will be gone, will be gone in two weeks it's not just spaghetti swipe. on the wall yeah. it's a it's a real thing <laughs> when you write the book and you say some shit you're like wow this is like i'm defining myself this is how i feel this is how i feel yeah, yeah. it's very Jinx. fascinating yeah no it's it's <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, I want to tell you about oh, Amy yeah, Cuddy. Oh, yeah, go, go, go. So anyway, so so is so what she was suggesting with the power pose is that she had various different samples of people. They had one group of people would go into a hunched over position that I had described previously, and then they would do saliva samples um, measuring cortisol, stress hormone, and testosterone. And so testosterone is you know associated with good cognitive function, energy levels, you know, feeling strong, confident, Confidence. all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, and then cortisol is like you're feeling, you're wigging out, you're getting ready to fight, flight, all those. And so what she found with that that was that consistently, when a person be an upright, strong, what I would call aligned position, then they end up actually uh, increasing their testosterone levels and decreasing their cortisol levels. And then the inverse would happen when a person was in a more of a, a hunched over kind of position, which is essentially is submissive. Yeah, which which the the kind of the really where this gets into book two as well, um, and I, I get into book one, but I want to go deeper into it. Uh, depression is the number one leading cause of disability worldwide presently. Yeah, you know, so you know, is alluding to Marshall McLuhan. Medium is the the message is like a big idea from him. So when we are 
in this room right now, or school would be an even better example. When you go to school, you think that your kids are being educated by you know, the, the contents that are in the books. Oh, I'm learning math. I'm learning Abe Lincoln. I'm learning poetry. Mm-hmm. What you th- are actually really truly being formed by is the positions that you are assuming while you're in that desk, the manner in which you're being educated by, you know, now it's the screens, you know, so that screen education, that is the medium that is actually the, 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 the overlying overwhelming message that is forming you. Mm-hmm. So we think it's just the, the contents of what we're getting from the medium, but in fact, it's the medium itself. So when you are a person that's getting all this information and you're inside of, say you're inside of a boxed room, maybe all the walls are just white, you know, and maybe you're getting these artificial blue lights. Maybe it's, you know, thermoregulated air conditioned air. It's always at this one set temperature. Maybe you learn that, okay, I need to raise my hand and ask politely if I got to go pee pee. Maybe like all of these different things. No, no moralistic judgment, wrong, right, good, bad, you know, but the fact that you're learning some math along the way. I think is very small potatoes in comparison to the actual, the constitution of the mold that you exist in. Oh, I, I, I totally agree. And you're, because if you think about it this way, to simplify, right, you're, you have a feeling within you that it presents itself in your body, but then the way your body is positioned also sends feedback back to the inside of you, maybe your brain. And it can easily become a, a feedback loop, you know, no different than when you have a, 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 a microphone and a speaker, you take the mic, you put it, you connect to the speaker, bring the mic close to the speaker, you get that super loud sound because this the speaker's picking up the sound from the microphone, but then projecting it and then picking it up. And it becomes this positive feedback loop that obviously, you know, is very offensive and, and loud. Hmm. If you feel afraid or sad and your body forms itself in the way that that exemplifies fear and sadness, then you also perceive the position that shows the inside of you, your brain and the body that I'm scared or that I'm sad. And then you feel it more and your body does it more and you get this positive feedback loop. And one of the best things you can do with any loop is inter- inter- you have to stop it, interrupt disrupt it. it. Yeah, you you have disruption. to disrupt the loop. And so if you're feeling, here's an easy thing you can do. If you're feeling like a bit out of control with negative feelings or whatever, and it may sound, it may feel silly it may seem like this is well, whatever. What do you mean? And I don't want to do that. And what's funny about feedback loops is you want to stay in one, which is interesting. Just try this. You feel like you're at a, go stand or move in a way that is different than the way you feel. So I am feeling sad and I'm feeling unmotivated. I'm going to stand tall and work out. You know, as much as I don't want to, I'm going to go do this. What will happen is your your brain will receive the signal that I know we feel this way, but here's what we're getting from the outside. This person's standing in a way that tells us that they're that we should probably feel a little bit better. We should probably feel a little bit more motivated. There's a study with uh, that this was an interesting one, where people held a pencil in their teeth. Yeah, smiling. Yeah, which which mimics smiling, and because of that, people felt like they were happier. And the inverse happens if you put a, a a golf tee in your eyebrows, so you go resting bitch face. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> fascinating, right? And when you see a person with resting bitch face, quite often they're kind of aggravated more than a person that kind of moves around all jubilant Mm -hmm. like there it's not just like a like a coincidence like you you literally and so there's a there's another guy that i've had on my podcast actually called paul ekman he's like one of the most cited psychologists in the world noam chomsky is noam chomsky the most Mm -hmm. i think so yeah you seen uh requiem for american dream no i haven't seen that yeah, you no. gotta watch that. Do I? All right. Oh All right. man, I saw that right. a long time ago. I can't even remember it though. Holy shit! All right, so um, Paul Ekman, he's he's interesting. I don't think he liked me. I think it was our conversation. <laughs> I, know, so I was like, <laughs> I was like, Paul, I respect you a lot, but I think you hate me. <laughs> so, so, anyways, um, he was a fella that studied um, various different facial expressions around the world, and he. Uh, his perspective went against uh, Darwin's perspective that um, there was you would learn certain facial expressions based off of your your cultural influence and then mimic them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that is true with like gang signs and like waving, like waving isn't a thing that just everybody just does. That's like, I have no weapons. You know, that's like something that you're learning and showing. You know, now we do elbow bump because of, you know, because of of things. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. That's not like just a natural thing. Um, 
Hugging probably is quite natural, though, is my mm. guess. But anyways, his facial expressions, though, he mapped out something like 10,000 different specific facial expressions that had um, specific meanings to feeling angry, sad, scared, happy, and you know, all of the, mm-hmm. all the different things. And each subtle little change of any of the muscles on your face uh, are indicative of a very specific meaning to the outside world, but also to yourself. You know, and so you see those very, very like overt examples of like a smile or the frown that causes a thing. Well, now extrapolate that out times 10,000 and you have like, wow, like I'm always painting a story with my face a la freaking Jim Carrey. Mm-hmm. Why is he so successful? He can contort his face into anything mm-hmm. so he plays he's like a he's like a like a savant with playing the instrument of facial expression which invokes a sensation much like if not exactly like uh, an instrument a person playing a saxophone mm. so and, and then you're giving it to yourself you're giving it to yourself and others just like when you're playing the sax so what or are, any instrument what are some best practices then that we can give or what you would give to clients um without going down the rabbit hole right because What we know from, you know, all of us have trained many, many clients, and I know that there's just this plethora of information that I've learned over decades of training and nutrition and movement, and I have to be very careful on how much of that I I put on a client Mm -hmm. if I really want them to put into practice and to see change and, and continue to grow in this area. Are there some best practices? Because you can get into cold therapy, you can get into meditation, affirmations, uh, posture, uh, mobility. There's so many things. That yeah, where somebody, do you start? Yeah, where do you start? And and are there are small things that you give clients to start with this st- and make this a habit, make it yeah. become unconscious, and then move to this? Are, do you have things like that? That's yeah, that's what the line method is. So that's a, so 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 breaking it down. I was kind of crying earlier about how like the publishers forced to be called five movement principles for you know stronger body and stress proof life and all the words and I'm like I hate this like I don't <laughs> like I think this is like it's it's so much more than that but uh you know because people need something to grab onto right, you need right. like a good handle um we do have a, a the second section of the book breaks down five fundamental principles that every person ought to have in their daily experience if they really give a dang about driving their body well um, and so the first thing that I would recommend to almost every client uh, would be, I mean, one walk, like you just got to walk more, you know, anytime that you have the opportunity to like go get groceries, it's like, dude, your family at some point probably made a pilgrimage across a continent <laughs> like for you to get to this point. So you can sit on your ass right. and order food off of your phone yeah. and wait for it to be delivered to your face, you know? And so, if you have the opportunity, you know, make it be a fun thing to, you know, get some reusable bags or a backpack and like, cool, I didn't get to hike in any mountains this year, but I did a bunch of little mini pilgrimages to the grocery store. While I was doing that, I got sun. Maybe I took my shirt off. I exposed my whole body to the sun. Maybe I took my sunglasses off. So I'm getting that, you know, that full spectrum of light going to my eyes, which is helpful with like, you know, all sorts of things. Helps your body, helps your body your body's production of neurochemistry it literally makes you a happier person. Right. Circadian rhythm, all kinds of stuff. All the stuff. Yeah. yeah. You know, so that would be uh, one thing. Another thing that I recommend to everybody is just spending a little bit of time on the ground each day. You know, so while I'm sitting in the chair here, I'm treating the chair kind of like as though we were sitting around a fire and, you know, I'm sitting on a rock or on a ground. In this case, I'm sitting up on a cushion. My legs are crossed. The reason that's valuable, I'm not just going to go through all the five things. I'll, I'll probably stop after this, but, um, and we can if you want, but it gets a little going. monotonous. Uh, but the big thing with spending time on the ground, one, you end up, in the book we call them resting postures of repose, which I borrowed from um, Muscles and Meridians by Philip Beach. Uh, but so these, these resting postures of repose are these natural tuning mechanisms that our bodies have had since the, the beginning of our evolution. You've naturally squatted all the way down to the ground, then you kneel a little bit, then you might reach your arms up overhead for a little bit to grab something. All of those positions, in this case, just specifically spend time on the ground, lying down on your back, lying down on your side. You know, when you're in those positions, you might notice, oh man, like my hip feels a little like sensitive, feels like beef jerky on that side. You're massaging your beef jerky hip by being on the ground. 
as opposed to floating in space all day, just getting clogged up like a dam. You know, and then when you're going that, you're also taking your hips through a full range of motion. So now you're opening and expanding and contracting those pelvic floor muscles. You you literally are a closed hydraulic system that needs to be pumped with regularity. If you are, you will be a healthy hydraulic system. If you are not, then you will be a stuck up, dammed up body. Dams are where festering and disease and, and things of the sort manifest. If the body is well circulated, then the body heals. When the body has obstruction, there's a uh, Andrew Taylor Still quote, who's the founder of osteopathy, says, harmony dwells where obstructions do not exist. Mm. So anywhere in your body that there is obstruction, you, that is the beginnings of disease. Anywhere where you can open that obstruction, allow new fluid in the form of lymphatic fluid and blood and you know all the things to circulate and move, your body, whoo, it starts to heal. Imagine that. you know. And so that's a lot of people, you know, they may have various different differing issues ranging from you know whatever 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 the ailment may be you know and then they might go to maybe say they go to peru you know and they do ayahuasca and they you know, it's like wow like i got healed of my thing after being in peru for a month it was the ayahuasca you know it was the shaman they had they cut a chicken head off and you know they, they these crystals and like all this stuff it's like well what else happened on that trip you were in peru <laughs> you, what else happened on that trip? Like yeah. you, you probably, you got in a different bed, maybe it was lower down the ground. Maybe you, you changed, you, you were forced to change your identity structure because now you're in a new place. People don't even speak the same language. Yeah. You can't be in that same rut pattern of get up, drink too much coffee, get in the car, sit in that same 90 degree position, get up, stumble into the next place, all revved up on coffee. And I'm already kind of in like this fight flight response, sit in that same position in the office, get up, walk to the other room, sit in the same position, getting back in the car, then go to the gym, do the same position, sitting on some seated row machine, get up, get back in the car, same position, go home, eat dinner in the same position, then sit finally, relax and have some Netflix on the couch in the same fucking position. You know, you go to another place and all of a sudden your body gets like, whoa, everything starts to kind of change and shift. You're starting to perfuse new fluid into all these places by changing your physical environment. It, it's crazy. We're talking about um, how important this is to, to, to fight off chronic pain and, and have uh, it's about the body. But there's also the side of, of, of mental and like relationship health that then this was part of the, actually the conversation that Katrina and I talked about last night, too. Um, that we hacked into a long time ago that speaks to your point. Um, we, in, we make it a point to disrupt our daily life and go somewhere uh, out of this environment because of that exact reason. Because yeah, I feel the same thing for relationship health. Uh, it's very easy to get in the, the minutia, uh, minutia of going through your day of uh, you know laundry, clean, walk the dogs, uh, go to work. And, and it's just this cycle that we, you can- We schedule sex on Tuesday. Right, right. You, you, start, to, <laughs> you start to lose- I love Tuesdays. You, <laughs> you start to lose sight of- Ta -ta Tuesday. Your, your relationship and the growth of it and the, and the, the health of it. And so, one of the best things that we found is to always schedule a, a trip away from home, even if we're just going up an hour and a half to the beach and we stay two or three nights at, at a hotel room or whatever on the beach, is just to interrupt you know, that, that, that same pattern that we're always in. And I think it's, it contributes to a lot of the success our relationship happens. And I think that's parallel mm -hmm. to what you're talking about well, with the body. Yeah. Chinese and, and Ayurvedic medicine talk a lot about congestion and blocks of energy. And mm -hmm. I think that, you know, years ago I had an acupuncturist that uh, was in my wellness facility and she would explain how acupuncture works, but through Chinese medicine terminology. And so I'd say, you know, it's interesting. I've seen the studies, the Western studies on acupuncture, and it does have pain relieving qualities. They've proven it. That's why insurance now pays for acupuncture. How does it work? And she said, oh, well, the needles open up energy flows from chi and this and that. And she's talking through Chinese medicine terminology. And I thought to myself, okay, well, here's what I know about Western medicine. I know we have referred pain. I know that oftentimes when you go to the doctor and you hear you hurt somewhere, they know that you might have an issue with your kidney or your heart, for example, your left arm. Everybody knows, knows that, right? You get left arm pain if you're getting a heart attack. Yeah. Maybe it's affecting the nerves. But really the point is it doesn't matter how we explain it. It's been observed. It's been observed by, by many, many people. And this congestion, this blocking thing that you're talking about, Ayurvedic medicine, Chinese medicine uh, talk a lot about it. Um, and here's some more interesting stuff about getting on the ground. 
They've done studies on people, and they're constantly trying to find one way, one test that can help predict all-cause mortality, right? Because that would be beautiful. That would be great for, for insurance purposes, for medicine purposes. We, it, and it's hard to find it. Is it blood pressure? Is it cholesterol? Is it triglycerides? Is it fasting insulin? Is it all? But now they're starting to stumble upon it. And there's, there's one that they found, which was, can you get up off the ground? Yeah. Can you get up? Can you, if we put you on the ground and don't help you, can you get up all by yourself? That is a greater predictor of all-cause mortality than any other singular uh, measurement that we have. Uh, the second closest would be your grip strength. Grip test, yeah. Just yeah. how strong you are with your hand. I how both, interesting is that? So I have so the, the, the th- one of the third movement principles in the book is, is hang with regularity each day. You know, so my, my recommendation with spending time on the ground is you know, I recommend 30 minutes, but you know, that's like half of a yoga class. Mm-hmm. You know, so if you're a person that just eats breakfast on the ground, you know, where you get mm. some big cushions and you maybe get like a low coffee table. Maybe you go outside in some grass and you're getting sun, you're stacking variables. You got to stack variables. You know, when you're living in an environment where you're very kind of like medicinal, isolated supplement form of fitness and, and life and all of the mm-hmm. things, you, you're not living life. <laughs> like you're, you're living this broken narrative of the way you're supposed to do it. If you just take your ass outside you know, during a nice day, get down on the ground, eat some food that's maybe, you know, helpful for your body, maybe do it with community, you know, all of those different things. It's like, it's this whole storm of positive variables all stacked together. And so the, so that's just one thing of kind of like making the spending time on the ground, you know, make it comfortable, you know, put your ground territory like near a window or something like that, get a really comfy rug, Mm. maybe get some foam rollers down there, maybe put a yoga mat down on the ground someplace. So it it welcomes because you Mm. become your environment. Marshall McLuhan, meeting his message. Uh, But then hanging, that's another one of those things that it could be uh, hypothesized or argued that we are, our ancestors were these arboreal creatures in Africa that started off in trees, whether that's true or not, you know, I don't, I don't really care. Uh, what you do know is that human hands are really good at reaching up over your head, grabbing onto trees or things of the sort and pulling yourself up. Well, look at the shoulder structure with the scapula. Yeah, but it's it, longer. We so are able to do it. We, we evolved to be able to reach up above our head hang and to throw things correct and if otherwise we would have totally different shoulders yep and so that's that's one of those things that what do you naturally is so if you hear that study about how you know grip strength is a higher indicator of cardiovascular disease than than blood pressure then you're like okay cool i'm gonna go get a you know one of those dynamiters and just start squeezing the shit out of it (laughs) it's like no you're doing the supplement bullshit form of life and fitness Mm -hmm. do shit that naturally engages that whole chain of muscles Mm -hmm. that would be indicative of a strong grip strength. Play jujitsu, grab a lapel, you know, grab, go climb a tree with your kids. Like why are kids such good teachers? Because they're, they're, they're more honest with their biology. So they don't. They don't know. They're not supposed to. They don't know. They don't have they're stories yet. It. They don't have narrative yet. Mm-hmm. You know. And so at some point, you were taught. You were misinformed that it's it's not mature to play. You were misinformed that it's not mature to balance on that curb or you know. I was just climb that tree. So no, we have we have things to do. We have. I've got my watch here. I've got my my Apple cell phone. I got like I'm, I'm in alignment. I got my schedule. My agenda. Kids are like, what? Yeah. Yeah. Like this is a play opportunity. What are you talking about? Like I don't want to leave right now. What a great lesson. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a, it's what a great lesson. Oh, and I've always pl- been such a big advocate of rotation, and, and like that's something I've just noticed right away. Just being in the gym environment, how little that's incorporated in anybody's programming. Doesn't matter if even if a personal trainer is having their client go through exercises, they're not really incorporating rotation as much as, and this is a vital uh, component to how our body moves. Yeah, you know, it's funny, Aaron, uh, again, having trained people for so long, towards the end of my career is when I really learned how to be really effective. Mm. And one of the most effective things I ever did for a client was integrate movement into their day, into their everyday ritualistic daily life. It was so effective at getting people to move more. So instead of doing the, do 30 minutes of cardio, 
every morning on your stationary bike. It was, well, you already eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner, so that's already a ritual. Mm -hmm. Walk 10 minutes after each one. Yeah. The consistency was amazing. Here's the thing. Studies also show it's more effective. When they compare a one-hour cardio session to three 20-minute sessions, the three 20-minute sessions burn more body fat, improve uh, stamina better, um, and are and have physiological benefits that are that uh, are better than the singular, the single time of spending on a piece of cardio equipment. We notice this with strength. You know, um, you go to the gym for an hour and you want to just get stronger. What if instead of you know doing 15 pull-ups, three sets of that in your back workout, you had a pull-up bar in your house, and every time you walked back by it, you did one pull-up. Every time you walked by it, you just did a pull-up. That's it. You know what's funny? The studies support that. Try, yep. And then try it out, by the way. The strongest I've ever been at certain lifts was when I practiced like that rather than doing the structured one hour or two hour workout. It's literally integrating these things into your life. So that's why I love so much what you said about eating breakfast on the ground. Because if because sometimes, and here's what I'll even, I'm even guilty of this. When I hear you say, get on the ground, I immediately think, I'm going to schedule 30 minutes of just being on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> right? Instinctually, right? Oh, I got to do this. I got to put this in my routine. <laughs> then you said eat breakfast on the ground, and I'm like, oh, oh yeah. All right. That was 25 I'm minutes. I'm, I'm already almost there. I'm already eating breakfast. Yep. I might as well get on the ground. What That's about it. watching TV on the ground? I, I watch TV every night for 30 minutes or an hour, you know, hanging out with my wife. Why don't I just sit on the ground yep. instead of on the couch? It's And it's in from a psychological standpoint or from a consistency standpoint, people are far more likely to, to, to be consistent when it's integrated in that way versus the... You know, make sure you schedule your cardio. Make sure you schedule your weight training session. Make sure you schedule your mobility session. It's like, well, what if you just, when you brushed your teeth, mm -hmm. you you got down into a squat, or you were barefoot and did some calf raises, or what if uh, you know you had a pull-up bar in your house and it's next to the TV, and whenever you're watching TV, uh, you you kind of hang a little bit and play on the pull-up bar. Way more effective. Yeah. Well, they, you you alluded to the research around the physiological part. There's research to support the behavioral side that it's more likely to be consistent if you do pair it with totally. another ritual. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, it's funny. You, I love that you started with the walking thing too, because we've talked uh, probably at nauseum on the show about uh, how we used to scoff at that in our early years as a trainer when a client would say like, "Oh, I walk every day." I'd right. be, <laughs> Yeah. Walking, you're not, you're not working out. Yeah, you're not right. training. You're not exercising. Yeah, you know, show me burpees, bitch. Yeah, right. And, <laughs> and then you look, you, you look at the way I talk to a client full circle, and that is actually the very first thing that I address. Yeah. It's just let's move and let's pair it with something you're already doing. I'm not going to ask you to go get on a treadmill for an hour every single day to do cardio. Let's break down your day and let's see a way that we can integrate that into your lifestyle because I know that. 20 minutes of that for the rest of your life every time you, after dinner is far more valuable than a six-month run of doing one-hour cardio every single totally. day. Totally. And, yeah. and, and a, here's a big part of it too, Aaron. Because we're constantly trying to get people to, a, to adopt some of these habits and to do them, first we have to get them to accept them. So you have to sell the idea. So I'm, I'm going to sell this for you right now, right? <laughs> uh, years ago, a device hit the fitness scene and it was uh, you know a big part of the the gym that I started my career in, 24 Hour Fitness, it was called a body bug. And a body bug, and there's a lot of these things now, but they were the first ones. You put it on, and it was relatively accurate at calculating how many calories you burned. And it did through through movement and skin temperature, and there was, it was a very complicated device. It was actually groundbreaking, and it was relatively accurate. You put it on, and you could you know, get into your computer and look up and be like, oh, I burned 2,500 calories today. I burned 3,000 calories today or whatever. And again, it was, a, it, was, it was relatively accurate. And even, even when you compared it to the very complex metabolism measuring machines that you have at universities. And I remember this. It was, it was, it was just mind-blowing for me. I'd have clients that would come in and work out three days a week with me or, and two days a week on their own, five days a week. They'd put on the body bug and we would look at their calories. And I remember that we would look at their – I'd pull it up on the computer – and I'd be like, oh, man, what did you do on Saturday and Sunday? You burned like 30% more calories on Saturday and Sunday. Like, why? Well, did you work out? Like, I thought you only worked out five days a week. Oh, no, no. I, I was just, uh, oh, I was, I was gardening and then I washed the car. Oh, that's when I went to the mall with my friends and we were shopping. Yep. And I remember like it melted my brain because I'm like, holy cow, five days a week you're in here working out for an hour. But then you go to work and do nothing all day long. On those days, you're not even scheduling a workout and you burned way more calories. So here's how I sell what we're talking about. You just want to get lean, do this anyway. Incorporate it into your everyday life anyway, even if you don't care about all the other stuff that Aaron's talking about and what I'm talking about. If you want to burn fat effectively, 
The most effective way to do it is to incorporate in, incorporate it into your daily life, into small doses, into the rituals that you already have. It's far more effective than trying to do scheduled calorie burn workouts. Yeah. Well, that yeah. I mean, that's exactly what the intention of making this thing called the Align Method, which again, I wanted to call it Align because I have resistance towards dogma. And so any, as soon as something's called a method, I'm like, oh, no, no. <laughs> With the publisher's like, no, bitch, like it's a method. <laughs> yeah. We're selling a method. I'm like, all right, whatever. Um, but that was the whole thing is being able to be somewhat of a Trojan horse and be able to slip into people's lives without feeling as though we are adding something new. Totally. You know, so it's with anything, it's like, you know, start the book out with, with an analogy of the, the golf swing, which isn't my analogy, but you know, when you're swinging at a club or swinging a club at a ball, you know, it's all it takes is the little fraction of a centimeter to be off, you know, in any direction. And you don't notice the change right in the beginning, but then, you know, give it 30 yards, 50 yards, it's 100 way yards. Off. And you're like, mm. oh, that's, oh, oh, wow. Like that's where that ball ended up. You know, and so that's what was you are moving throughout the day. What I created the book for was essentially to give people the lens to be able to examine what's the angle of their club in any instance throughout the day so they can make literally every moment an opportunity because you've got the know how to do it. Beyond that, whether you want to or not, it's up to you. I don't really Dude, care. I'm, I'm going to bring it all down mm -hmm. to the current situation. Okay. This is why I love home gyms so much. So uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I invested in a home gym. I have a garage gym, basic setup, but everything you need, right? Barbell, dumbbell, cage, you know, bands, all that stuff, right? And uh, there was a weekend that was coming up and, and uh, my wife and I, like, we don't really have anything scheduled this weekend. I said, you know, I remember reading these Soviet studies on Olympic weightlifters and how when they'd work out all day, they got these phenomenal results. I said, I'm going to give this a shot. So what I'm going to do is every other hour, I'm going to go out to the garage. I'll pick three exercises. My goal is going to be strength. So I'm going to do like a row, a bench press, um, and uh, overhead press or something like that, right? And I'd go out and I'd do six reps of each, three sets each, and it was moderate intensity. Not intense, not super easy, but nothing crazy. And I'll do that every other hour. And the strength gains I got from a single session and how I felt blew me away. So I'm going to bring it now to the, to the current uh, situation, current climate. A lot of people are at home. They can't go anywhere. They can't do anything. Here's a great opportunity to do, instead of your 60-minute workout, why don't you do three 20-minute workouts or six 10-minute workouts throughout the day? Schedule them throughout the day. First of all, you're going to feel better because you're going to get those good feelings from movement throughout the whole day. It's like a, an IV drip of a feel-good chemical rather than a single shot of it one time during the day. And on top of it, you will notice that your body will respond a little bit better. It's crazy and but it's 100 we'll, percent true and watch how that bleeds into every other aspect of your life yeah. your communication with your friends exactly. your business that you're doing like the production that you get done get done it's amazing so that's it seems like there's not a necessity to keep on confirming the the, the point that consistent movement matters but um another person that i've i've had on the podcast called joan vernicos she she's worked with nasa for like the last 40 years i don't think she liked me either actually i think, <laughs> I think you're so I think you're so you, likable though what's what are you doing bro? i think there seems to be a consistent trend with uh when i do podcasts over the internet uh, remotely yeah. and if it's with a baby boomer I think there's been a consistent trend where I'm like, I, I think that person kind of hated me yeah. afterwards. <laughs> I think it's something, maybe I'm arrogant. I'm not sure what it is exactly, but that's what I've noticed. You're polarizing. You're but I love hippies. her. But nonetheless, I, I, like, I like her and I like her books. And one of the things that she pointed out was that uh, astronauts, she was studying the, the health of astronauts in space without gravity. And what mm -hmm. she found was that the astronauts that would do small bits, like little titrates, like you said, like drips of fitness throughout the day, they would age significantly slower, typically versus the ones that would do like the CrossFit blowout workout in space for three hours and just really doing it. And then the rest of the day just kind of float in space, mm -hmm. you know, and work with instruments. And so the people that would do that, they would go through literally this rapid aging process where their bones would become less dense and their muscles would mm -hmm. atrophy and cognitive CrossFit function would doesn't even work in space. <laughs> <laughs> that's Boom. Oh, that's a quote. That's funny. But so what's, what's really interesting with that is it's like the same analogy, that, Sal, that, that you were referencing that you know, I have, I've, I've, I've referenced before describing it as like you wouldn't drink all of your water 
first thing in the morning no. or three days a week. You know, so you wouldn't say, okay, cool. I want to have whatever you want to have. Say you want to have a gallon of water a day, which might be a lot or a little, whatever. Um, but I, you don't smash out two gallons on Tuesday and then another two gallons on Thursday. It's sips, you know, and so those systems are literally, they're, you know, they're congruent. They're working with each other. You drink water, you eat food, and then you move it through your body. You know, so that all of those systems are integrated and they're all based off of continual movement. You know, and so when, if you start to look at things like that, like, okay, cool, while I'm having this conversation, maybe we could uh, do a walking meeting. You know, so throughout the day, like, where can I start to fill without, how can I just make my day more efficient, better, more productive, more happy, um, and not lose any of the the progress that we were doing or lose any of the productivity, you know? And so if you go for a, a walking meeting with you your people- You actually get more productive. You get more productive. Absolutely. And you start thinking outside of the box. And so if what you need is your employees or yourself to be more of like a, a Scantron type thinker, you know, you have the information already, you just got to jot it down. Uh, studies show that sitting in that, you know, sitting on the chair or I would recommend being on the ground and just being focused in and getting it done, you can access that information quite fine, mm. even more effectively. But if you want to go start thinking outside or divergently thinking, then you need to diverge your body out of that same stuck, focused, convergent position. I don't know if convergent and divergent exactly work in that as far as like describing movement of the body, but when you move the body in a, a way that's not just the standard mold that we get when we're sitting in yeah, chairs all day long being cogs in a wheel, when you go outside of that, all of a sudden you start thinking, oh, what if we, you know, um, Steve Jobs, he had walking meetings with everybody. Mm -hmm. you know, and so it's like you start thinking of things like, man, what if we made these computers different? Mm -hmm. Like we ha I have all of this intrinsic information that's already in my brain. You know, and the way that I've been formed is such that I can kind of treat myself like a catalog and just go in and sit and go through the catalog. But if I start to move a little bit differently, then I start bucking against the system. You know, and then I start becoming somewhat of like a revolutionary. But it could could potentially start from actually the way that I move my body because as I move my body, I'm moving my mind. Yeah, this, the, there's many systems of adaptation of the body that uh, react and, and adapt better when it's small doses and frequent, uh, you know, the way your skin tans, for example, is a good example. Going outside and getting just right. absolutely hammered by the sun isn't going to give you a great tan uh, like going out and getting doses of it uh, throughout the day. The way that we learn, it's better to, rather than doing one eight-hour class and trying to learn everything, doing, you know, eight one-hour classes uh, throughout the week is probably going to be more effective. Yeah. And the way you build muscle. You know, the way that we designed our MAPS programs, for example, is how we've observed that frequency just works better for most people. I, I identified this with blue collar workers in my family who didn't work out, but, you know, my, my mechanic uncle had muscular forearms and my mail carrier aunt had great looking calves. Everything else looked out of shape. I couldn't figure out what was going on. It's because of that frequent stimulation. So we've injected that even into the workouts that we designed where we're throwing in these frequency builders because it works. And even from a superficial build muscle, burn body fat, and here I am selling it again, but I think this is important. You need to sell these ideas to get people to even try them. These frequent levels of stimulation, these small doses, they get your body to get in shape more effectively. And then again, you throw in the behavioral aspect, you're more likely to stay consistent yeah. on top of it. So uh, it's something that is uh, we often don't talk about. Um, I know fitness tends to be designed around hard, intense, singular sessions and then rest. And I know bodybuilding was like, hammer your biceps on Monday and then wait till next Monday to do it again. Doesn't work nearly as well for people to do it that way versus uh, instead of doing 20 sets of Monday for your biceps, why don't you do you know, you know, know, five sets four days a week yeah. and, and see what happens. And start looking at your, your fitness, which I always do fitness in quotations because I think it's kind of a funny word. You're fit for whatever you do. You know, if you're sitting on a computer, you know, hammering out tweets all day. That's how you're going to be you're, fit for you're that. you're fit for that. You'd be better. <sighs> better at that than a person that's climbing trees and stuff because the tree climbing parkour jujitsu sun beach guy is gonna be like ah like it's freaking me out like i'm not fit for this you know so fit first it's just define what your goals are and then from there if you have a vision then you can define what the best approach or, or route is um yeah what's method four we have we've addressed three what's four? Oh, hinging from the hips 
Okay. Oh, that's, that's a really important. big one. Yeah. So, so, so really Speak to that. So, so lever leveraging leverage, you know, if, 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 uh, give me a lever and I can, I can move the world, you know, so it's like, uh, it's, who said that? Uh, a philosopher. philosopher, philosopher fella. It was, uh, I don't remember I've his got name. It, I've got it written there. It's really, uh, what is it? Look it up. Dr. Seuss. Dr. Seuss. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's my favorite philosopher. But yeah. So figuring out, okay, I've got all these levers on my body. I'm not, I've never been taught to take advantage of any of them. You know, so in, in high school or middle school gym class, like it's like, okay, you need to remember to bring your shorts. Uh, you need to show up on the Archimedes lever. Yeah. There you go. I can't um, believe I didn't remember his name. I know. I can't believe that. I was very sad. Um, you know, so, so that's a big thing is, is understanding if you've ever done any kind of martial arts, maybe you did judo or maybe you did jujitsu, you can understand that the difference between my hips being just half an inch this way or that way. Oh, huge difference. Is all the difference in the world. Because you've you've granted yourself the power of leverage, so as you are moving through the world, you can do certain things. Uh, you can make it so that literally your whole entire day is is like an opportunity to make yourself better. Like I truly a million percent believe that. Um, and and one of those things is when you say you pick something up off of the ground, maybe you're chopping vegetables, maybe doing anything. You can start to play with those basic mechanics that you would learn. I'm sure you guys teach in your maps program. I'm sure if anybody's ever had a trainer or read a muscle and fitness they'll talk about hinging those hips so nice long neutral spine and driving the hips backwards as you're doing that uh you're literally you're starting to be able to activate all of the the powers of the hips mm. if you don't do that then you're going to be outsourcing more of that energy into the knees and into the quads and into thoracic spine and all these places like that's not that you're not doing it right like you're trying to, you're trying to, uh, you know, lift your car up and you Shortcut. got the lever thing. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, dude, who gave you a, a, a three inch lever? <laughs> it's like, you know, I have a, I have a six foot lever in the garage. Right. Like, do you want me to grab that for you? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like, it's like, oh no, I got, I got this thing. And you're like, you are so ineffective at picking your baby up off of the ground. So let's, let's, okay, so four is hip hinge. So what are some simple best practices? I mean, I could think of just simply, you already touched on getting on the ground, just you being down in a squat. I love to talk about squat and scroll, right? Practicing, if I'm going to get on my phone and I'm going to go on Instagram or okay. whatever, to drop down into a full deep squat. I mean, we're, you're practicing the hinge there. Or do you have other things that you like to incorporate with clients? No. Um, I mean, with working with clients specifically, you know, so in like my, my programs or book or any of those places, I give you the mechanics. I give you a few basic examples like, okay, here's how you do it. Yeah. Now, what I'm really interested in is can you start to be curious about wow. making this happen in your daily life? Got what it. can what you do become you do with creative it? with your movement? Yeah, anytime you pick something up, do you, you, yep. you know, hip hinge. Or you whatever. know exactly how to do it. Whether you do it or not, totally up to you. Mm -hmm. Do you know how to do it? Right. Most people would say, I don't know how to do it. Right. And if you really look, if we got a thousand people in here and everybody did a squat, I mean, all four of us would be like, oh, oh man. Yeah, yeah. Majority. You know, it, bad. All bad. Oh, yeah. people can't hit hip. That's, all, that's something you, it's one of the fundamental things you have to teach as a trainer. It's it's the foundation. Yeah, yeah. Bend here, not here. Bend here. It's yeah. like, well, my, they can't. So it's in our assessment. And so it's like, it's, of course it is. You know, and so it's like, why was that not in your assessment as a, as a eight year old? You know, because why we have desi that, we've designed a world where you don't yeah. do that. You don't. You do, lose it. You don't do that. You lose that, mm -hmm. and then you start blaming your body for failing you, and then you start seeking out to heal this system that it's inherently healing if you give it the proper fundamental raw materials, nuts and bolts, schematics of how the freak to move, mm. how to eat, how to be in nature occasionally. You know, how do you maybe okay? I can't be in nature. I got to be in this office all day. Bring some nature into your office. You know, maybe open the window and let that full spectrum of light come through. Oh, next, maybe next, bring some plants in there. Maybe next get studio, a little waterfall device. Next studio we build, we've talked about this that we're going to have a retractable uh, oh, yeah. roof. We need, yeah, all we those need things. Sun. Yeah, so we could just open it up. So and have we have to in. do it all, and we'll do it right after this because we this is we've already been in here now this since this morning since what four or five hours. We always always fill this, and we've now made it a practice that if we've spent a couple hours in here, that we stop whatever we're doing, we go out and we walk around the block for. Yeah five times if you're having pain in your body it's been shown that people who have access i know you guys are familiar with this if they have access to looking out a window or even seeing a painting with nature yeah. they'll have less necessity for painkillers yeah oh, that's interesting uh -huh. if you give them the, weird? if you give them the power to choose 
how the, the dosage of painkillers, they will choose less because you've empowered them. Yeah. So I care way more about empowering a person to say, give me an equation. I learned how to process this. It doesn't matter what it is, as yeah. opposed to saying, okay, I don't know any of the, you know, tens of thousands or whatever people that are, are listening to this. Uh, I don't know what you do, but I can give you the basic fundamental equation that will relate to any situation. And then it's like, oh, okay, cool. Kind of off subject, but you just reminded me of something. Have you seen the, I think it's Apple TV that did a, a series called Homes. Did huh. you see, have you seen that? No. There's, oh, it was amazing. So uh, you, you just made me think of something that I, I, I hope that we we have some research in the future because uh, there's like a movement, and I believe it started in Sweden, Justin. I don't mm -hmm. remember, I think uh, it's becoming popular where they're building these greenhouse homes. Yeah, greenhouse homes. Cool. So a home inside of a greenhouse. Cool. And so it'd be really interesting to see like a family that was raised in that, and if we had multiple people that we could measure like what what kind of long term effects that that potentially has. I mean, I I, I love the idea. I speculate it. that it would make a huge difference. To it. Yeah, uh, everything uh, that's boost, good. boost your immune system. You know the phytoncides off of the plants. Mm -hmm. You're literally mm -hmm. creating a little uh, hermetic stressor on your immune system that's saying, boom, boom, boom. "Okay, bulk up, be strong." No, but if you put yourself into, and this is very relevant for, for the now, if you put yourself into a uh, hyper sanitized, sterile environment, you begin to die. <laughs> your body needs something to wrestle with. And so if you're continually just nuking your own natural microbiome and skin biome with all of this stuff that just, okay, just kill it all, kill it all, kill it all. Multiply that. You can do that. You can wage war on yourself for a little bit. Multiply that times a whole cultural shift for years mm. and see what happens with that. Mm. As opposed to the people say that, you know, the, 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 uh, uh, what are they, what are they called? The people, the centurions, what are they called? The blue zones. Yeah. You know, where there's like, what are they doing? Oh, and there's 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 contention around everything, including blue zones. But right. um, you know, what are they doing? Oh, they're doing what salmon. They're in the freaking garden. What's in the garden? A whole lot of dirt. Hmm. You know, kids that grow up with a dog or around a farm, what does a dog bring into the house? Mm -hmm. Oh, lots of different bacteria and viruses. Oh, and all these I, things. I think they the contention allergies. The contention around blue zones is that many people have cherry picked the data to support whatever they're trying to sell, right? But yeah. there are some things, and we've talked about that, that are very common. And community and being outside is one of the most common themes amongst all of them. Yeah, yeah they we, feel connected. Yeah, the Western medicine model is to isolate the one thing that does all the stuff, and we forget about the, the content text and the combination yeah. of things you know like oh that 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 solves pain that's uh, let's make aspirin because that's based off the white willow bark and then we forget that it has all this other stuff in it that prevents things like overdose and actually can be good for you whereas if you just take too much aspirin all the time it can cause yep. problems and we forget about that so we we stopped on four what's five <laughs> you're gonna be, you're gonna put me in a position where I forget again. The fifth one is, is nose breathing. Okay, uh, <laughs> I can't believe we didn't even go there. I was like, of course that has to be in there. I I tell Dude, you nose what, talk, too. talk about one of the most breathing in general, but nose breathing with emphasis on nose breathing. Maybe one of the most underrated ones. Uh, man, I I know. So I I'm notorious for having a, a really hard time at night settling my brain down and and you know, going to sleep. It just, it, it, for some reason, uh, and I've, I'm sure I've trained myself this way to work long hours. And, you know, because we talk about how important it is to get good rest, it's something that I'm always trying to put all these practices in place to improve that. And, but sometimes life happens. Sometimes it's a very stressful long day and, you know, a lot's on my mind or I got bombarded with multiple things. And so it really challenges uh, the, those practices that I've tried to put in place. And some of them are uncontrollable. Like I was still working till 11 o'clock at night and I had nothing I could do about it. Yeah. And my saving grace is, uh, is the, is the nose breathing or taking or box breathing right, is what I use before I go to bed. And, you know, and Katrina and I will actually do it together. Uh, and she's, she believes that she can hear me thinking like she'll, we'll be laying in bed and like, I won't even say anything. We'll be, have been there for probably 20 minutes and I'll get like an elbow. Stop it. I can hear you. Mm, you know, she'll do that to she's me. She's sensitive. I yeah, believe it. Yeah. Yeah. And then she'll do that to me. And then, you know, if it's, if it's bothering her so much that it's ruining her sleep, she'll say, breathe with me, you know, and then we'll breathe together. And I swear to God, man, that's, it's, uh, it's wild. How, how powerful that, that can be and how impactful it can be. Well, you know, uh, not breathing through the nose changes the structure of your face Certainly. and your nose. Yeah. They actually have shown this. They've done studies where people will purposely block their nose and they, the, the structure of the, the jaw 
the mouth and the nose actually change. So people with deviated septums, for example, who can't breathe and then they get it fixed, it's life-changing for them. And if you look at pictures of them after the procedure, you see some structural changes to the face. Yep. It's, I, I just learned this recently. It's really crazy. Mm. That's why you can tell, uh, I mean, for if you want to go just completely superficial, you know, I don't care about any scientific stuff, chicks will be more attracted to a guy with a chiseled jawline. Mm. Why is that? It's an indication that biologically speaking, that's a high functioning male that could provide. They're probably more testosteronic and they've probably got better sperm count and they're they're just it's like a Tesla versus like an old civic. So the old civic guy is the person with the receding chin and they're kind of a little bit kind of just like soft and you know, all of those all of those things. It's like nothing wrong, nothing right, no moralistic judgment, anything like that. But there's a difference between a Tesla and a fifteen year old civic. You know, and the, and the Tesla, you get in and you're whoa, like, whoa, what was that? It's like, oh, well, the mechanics are pretty on point. You know, everything is sharp. Mm. And so when you're breathing through the nose, uh, I mean, a lot of things will happen. One, naturally, if you want to get into kind of more of like an, like an Eastern type perspective, you're connecting the, the tongue naturally to the roof of the mouth. You know, so if you wanted to get weird, you could say you're, you're completing the, the microcosmic orbit, you know, and mm. so getting into like meridians and all that stuff. It's like connecting this energy channel goes all the way up top of the head all the way down to the front down the perineum and up the back and i don't i you know i don't know i think i think from a you know from just mechanical again nuts and bolts like lifting heavy stuff perspective you can get more strength out of that calling a thing a microcosmic orbit immediately puts me into like a tinfoil hat <laughs> yeah. kind of like <laughs> category yeah. but it is interesting it just so happens that that is east and west cross the intersection a lot yeah a lot. There's I don't know if all the time, but I think if you give it enough time, it's pretty close to all the time. It's 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 uh it's it's wisdom. It's all wisdom, and there's truths in all of them. And sometimes they say it differently. Yeah. But they're saying the same thing oftentimes. And there's different approaches. And I think you're uh, it's a, a huge disservice to yourself to just stick to one, just like with exercise. I'm only going to do this one method yep. and I'm going to ignore all these others. Huge disservice. And so the, so with more more facial structure stuff, so you're the, 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 your facial muscles will naturally be kind of pulling you in. You know, so when you are, are closing your jaw and you're going through and you're breathing with the nose, especially like growing up as a, as a baby, if you just kind of allow that just like lock, slack, jaw, yeah. it'll, it'll, you literally start to cave in on yourself. Mm. Like you need to, you need to create some internal pressure. You need to push out in order to grow into a strong body. And so that person that's continually just ugh, slack jaw, you know, breathing through their mouth, you're they're missing out on filtering the air. They're missing out on changing the temperature of the air to be more, you know, ready to be actually assimilated. Uh, they're missing out on the production of nitric oxide. So they're, now they're missing out on cardiovascular function. Now they're missing out coming back to picking up chicks. If, you, if that's what you're, you're interested in, if you're a guy, well now ED, erectile dysfunction. If I'm not, if I'm going to go out and get a supplement, maybe I'll go get beet juice or something in order to increase nitric oxide. Well, you realize that you naturally just through tapping into your own innate mechanics, you can produce this stuff just by you know walking through a room and breathing see, right. See now you're selling it. I love it. Yeah, yeah, you, want, you want boners? Breathe through your nose. Dude, seriously. <laughs> all that stuff is legit. It, it, all come, it's, it all comes back to evolution, man. Totally. Everything that we're doing, it all comes back to a bunch of animals trying to figure this thing out. We're trying to eat. We're trying to get laid. And we're trying to create shelter. We're trying to perpetuate the species. And, be, and because we're so complex, a big part of that is trying to find purpose and meaning. Because mm. without that, it's uh, too big of a struggle for smart apes like us. What a weird time. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, right. Back to Russia. And Let's talk about yeah, coronavirus. Yeah. Yeah. Don't you dare! Yeah. No. Hey, listen, you're you're always a good time, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're always a great time, man. Yeah. Hopefully, this, you feel like we like you, right? You yeah. don't you don't get the, yeah. the vibe that this we don't feels like. like feels like Ta Ta Tuesday. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're not having sex. Okay, yeah. we're not gonna have. Yeah. Not this time. Sex. It's a Not pandemic. We're going to maintain distance. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. yeah. Well, or we could do what Canada recommended. You see what Cana uh, Canada had this like this recommendation for sex, and they actually advocated for, <laughs> for glory holes. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> bold, yeah. bold move, Canada. Yeah. Yeah. Because of the pandemic. Hey, if you want to bang somebody, just do it through a hole in the wall. Yeah. <laughs> It'll keep you safe. Damn. Yeah. No, isn't that funny? I saw wearing masks during coitus. That was. I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah. I don't understand. Yeah, there was a time. There was a time when condoms weren't a thing, you know. And then the HIV came out, and that's like, oh, yeah, now yeah. it's the next, the next level. Of now, yeah, pretty soon we'll just be 
Yeah, full body. Robot full body. Robot banging. Well, perhaps, you know, this gets into like Elon Musk simulation stuff. We'll be sitting inside of a tube someplace plugged up to nutrients while we're like leading digital lives. Mm. Do you think that's the only safe way to do it? Do you think you don't want your actual biological body to go out there? You could die. Yeah. yeah. Do yeah. your digital. I think body. we'll quickly <laughs> we will quickly realize we don't we don't really know what we need. I think we're going to give us ourselves everything we ever wanted and desired and yeah. be extremely depressed. Mm. Aaron, are you a sci-fi guy? Do you watch sci-fi stuff? Not enough. I'd be more creative if I was. Well, it's no, a, I'm, a, I'm just interested link. if you think there's a there's a movie that's out there that depicts our future the best. Idiocracy. <laughs> oh yeah. man, yeah. I haven't well, seen that. You haven't seen that? What? No. You oh, haven't? dude. Oh yeah. This guy. Uh, so I saw this a long time ago. But oh, it's an it, old movie. He gets fro. He gets frozen 90s. or whatever. Yeah. And he he's uh, you know reanimated or whatever in the future. And this like pro wrestlers president. Um, and dumb people were having more kids than smart people. Yeah. Anyway, everything went backwards, <laughs> and everybody's really dumb, and Great. they don't drink uh, water. They drink the soda. The soda, because it's full of electrolytes, and they feed it to their plants. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's a comedy. It's, it's, it's a comedy. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to have to. painfully accurate. And, and he's, a, painfully he's accurate. a normal dude. He's an average dude, but, but because the future gets so stupid, he's like the smartest man in the world. Yeah. When they, you know, when he, yeah. when oh, they really? really bring him back. Just because he's an average I can't believe I've never seen this or even heard <laughs> uh, of this. Oh, before. Yeah. I've got to watch you it. you got to watch it. Yeah. I thought surrogates. Surrogates to me with Bruce Willis, I feel uh, like, is very close to where we're heading. I believe Matrix, that we're, Matrix is another Yeah, game. right. That's, those are kind of very similar, right? That we're going to be plugged Orwell. in. I think there's going to be, I think there's going to be a clear division of of uh, humans in the they future. They live. That's what I think. They're, yeah. There's going to be the, the plugged in and then <laughs> yeah. the unplugged people. I think, they're, I think I we're agree. smart enough and there's enough of us that uh, see the writing on the wall and that I think if, if it keeps going uh, crazier and crazier that direction that I think will revolt and go the other direction but I do think there will be a mass majority that will fall in line I think 100% our own arrogance is going to be our downfall we're so smart we give ourselves everything we think we want we can satisfy every pleasure which is going to start to get closer and closer to that and then we're going to realize this is not it's like that scene in the matrix when um when uh, they capture, uh, what's his name, Morpheus, mm -hmm. and Agent Smith, is that his name? Yeah, Agent Smith, Smith is talking to him and he says, you know, in the beginning, the first Matrix was a utopia for humans. We made it perfect. And your feeble mind couldn't perceive that things could be so good and we lost entire crops yeah. of humans. We so they, rejected it. They had, to remake, they had to remake the Matrix with all the challenges of, uh, of you know, real life in the 90s or whatever at the time. Whoa. that they Because like, like, humans can't live in a... In a, we don't know what utopia is. We think no. we know, and we would create it if we could digitally. We'd be too bored with perfection. Uh, not just that. There's no meaning and purpose of things. Imagine if you could just – this is when people ask us this question all the time. What if there was a pill that, that made you fit, lean, and healthy? Like, would that be the answer? And I'm like, well, no, because most of the benefits you get from eating right and exercising is the pursuit of it's doing so, it's not the 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 but that's not the the result of it. It's the pursuit of it. That's well, we have ex I think we see yeah. examples of this with the Uber rich all the time. I mean, I, I feel like I see or celebrities. Yeah, like I, I where I feel like there's more Uber rich or celebrity people that look depressed, sad, oh, yeah. or have so much pain and sorrow in their life than I think of that. Like, oh man, they they look really happy or they really like got it all together. So and yet they have the ability to pretty much no, buy or have anything that this earth has to offer. Do, do you know Daniel Everett? Uh, don't sleep. There are snakes. Have you heard of that book? No, no, Sorry, no. The Paraha people in the Amazon. No, um, I said the Amazon, so it's just one country. I think it was Brazilian Amazon. I'm not sure, but but um, what he found in studying these these Paraha people, he went out there as a, a Christian missionary, and mm -hmm. so his intention was to go and you know convert them over and get them Bibles and the whole thing. And uh, he went out there kind of with his own version of like resting bitch face. And the Paraha, Paraha people, they documented the amount, yeah, there's the book, they documented the amount that they smile to uh, determine like level of happiness. It's kind of a weird thing whenever you see like- Oh, I've heard somebody this, reference this before. Whatever university is the happiest place in the world. It's like, how do you figure that out? Who takes surveys? Like, what is it? Yeah. But so the way that they documented was literally just measuring the amount of time that they're smiling throughout the day. And comparing it to all other cultures that they compared it to, uh, these Paraha people apparently were the, the most smiliest people. And what was interesting with that is they don't have any of the their language structure and their belief systems are completely different than that of modern hyper analytical 
aggregate stuff, quantity, quantity, quantity. And so they don't even have uh, any numbers. They don't have any sense of history beyond their life. So if you tell me about Jesus, I'm like, is this your brother? Is this your, like, <laughs> give me more details. And they're it's like, oh, no, this present. is a guy 2,000 years ago. They're like, 2,000, what does that even mean? What are you talking about? So they didn't even um, have a conception of that. that. that uh, yeah. You know who talked about that? Um, Justin, who went over to the Congo. And he, ta- and he talked about their perceived happiness within their community with having like nothing. Nothing. Like they had like one pair of clothes, a pair of sandals. And we're, like, we're, we're, we're like, I don't know enough about computers to deem whether this is an appropriate analogy, but I think we're like computers in the sense that we only have so much bandwidth. And so if you offer the majority of the bandwidth out to, to material unanchored shit, then that's where your energy goes. You know, and so if that's where you're thinking, that's where your mind is occupied. And now all of a sudden, well, I have evidence. I've got mm. two Lambos. I got the new Lambo SUV, dog. I'm coming up. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I was like, oh, it's like, that's me. Yeah. It's like, no, no, no. <laughs> you know, so if you don't have any of that, you don't even have the opportunity to make that you. Yeah. You don't have any opportunity to identify with that. Right. You know, and so if you don't have the opportunity to identify with that, it's like, what do I have around? It's like, well, I have people. Well, I have my body. I have my, my friends. Right. <gasps> I have, this, I have cool, my kids. this cool stick that I made, right? <laughs> wow, I have this this food. Wow, it's not amazing. It's not, you know, comparison to like if I was like Paris Hilton, you know, but it's like it's but you don't it even nourishes have that, you me. You don't even have that comparison though. That's all you know. Right. Right. But but if it's like if that's what you have, it's like the five movement principles. It's like break it down to like simplistic, like what do I have in front of me? If you have less, it makes it easier for you to actually pay attention to the things that matter because those are intrinsically with you. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, you know, we live in these modern market-based societies and and markets do one thing better than any other system. They give us what we want and they innovate very, very well. What's the weakness in that? It's what we want. Yeah. And we don't know what we need. We only know what we want. And what I want right now is pleasure, distraction, entertainment, good tasting, you know, you know, hedonistic value of the food and I don't want to move. So you're going to get a lot of that. And, uh, it's not really what you need. I think sometimes when you're forced in a situation, then you start to really, you know, realize things. The thing is it's, it's, it's no one's fault, you know? So I think it's really easy to like shit on modernity and shit on Western culture. It's like, Oh, like these guys and they don't care about anything. No, it's, it's learning. Yeah. And so, but if you think about the amount of commercials that you're exposed to, I think it's something like by the age 30, you're exposed to something like 20 million commercials or some ridiculous number. Your whole life, since you're a little person, and then also multiply that times you know, your, your parents' perspectives and the world that they grew up and all the commercials they've been exposed to, it's literally all of those commercials are selling you the idea that you will be enough, you will be loved, you will be supported, you will be all of the things when you have our shit. And so literally, like your you, your software system, unless you un- choose to actively unlearn it, you need to go out of your way to actively unlearn it, is such that I will be whatever, you know, enough when I make this money and buy dude, that thing. Dude, I, I had a such a, a mind-blowing paradigm shift a while ago, and I'm going through it now. So my wife's pregnant, right? She's in the third uh, trimester of pregnancy. And a while ago on the podcast, I have very minimal knowledge of natural childbirth and the history of it. My knowledge at the time was what I had heard. And I remember on the podcast, I said, oh yeah, childbirth is so dangerous. Number one cause of death in women throughout all of history thank God for modern medicine and blah, blah, blah. Well, anyway, I got a message from a midwife who was like, you're so wrong. And that's not how it works. And, you know, I, I, she's, she's obviously an expert and I went back and forth with her and debated and discussed. And she got me to the point where I became open-minded and I said, well, okay, well, this is interesting. Then I started learning more about the natural childbirth process. And I started to see that the way that we treat childbirth in, in Western societies is the way we treat everything with Western medicine, which is it's a, it's a medical emergency. Because yeah. that's what Western medicine does really well. You cannot compare with Western medicine for dealing with uh, medical emergencies. There is no system that's better at that. But like anything you're really good at, if you are a hammer, everything's a nail, right? So that's how they treat it. And you see it in the movies. This is how I was conditioned. Oh my God, the woman, the water broke, rushed to the hospital. Ah, my wife's pregnant. What's going to happen? Ah. Yeah. And, and you, she gets to the hospital and then the muscles of the, the cervix are like sphincters and, and like any sphincter muscle, it ain't going to relax unless you're relaxed. Correct. And your body's not going to have this baby unless you 
your body feels safe, right? And so we have this cascading event of interventions with, oh, you're not moving fast enough. Here's this, this, this chemical called Pitocin. Oh, now it really hurts. We got to give you an epidural. Oh, you can't have the baby. Let's do a C-section. And so I started learning about this. So now we're in this process of, of, of we're going to be doing, you know, childbirth with a midwife. I've learned about natural childbirth. I'm taking these courses and it's so interesting. I didn't know this, right? This is something that happens sometimes with women, right? They go through the process of natural childbirth and th- when they get, there's different stages of it. And once they start to get to the last stage, which is the most intense and things are really happening, sometimes the body will stop for about 30, min- 30 minutes to an hour. Hmm. They'll just stop. And the midwife say, oh, yeah, the, the body knows you need a break. It'll wow. just stop. doesn't mean you're not having the baby. It gives you time to get your energy back because the next phase is the baby's going to come out. Then The other thing they said was, don't worry about pushing. You will push. It just happens naturally. They said, And they said something to me, which was like, well, duh. If you knew nothing about childbirth, your body would have this baby. Yeah. It's going to happen. You don't need to know anything. And there's a lot of instinct and natural things that happen. And we've countered it so much that we've we've created something entirely different. It reminded me of that when when what we're talking about what we're talking about that we, you know, we go counter to what's natural for ourselves so much that we're causing ourselves a lot of problem. And it's everything from how much stuff we have, all the stuff we think that's going to make us happy. When in reality, a lot of what makes you happy is your mindset, what's within you, how you perceive things, and people. People is what really makes people happy. In fact, it's a- People a, that care about you. That's for, right. For more than the shit that you've worn on your sleeve. Right, right. Good people. So, so, the, so it, but, and, and once again, it is, I like the idea of taking full responsibility for everything and also at the same time saying, okay, it's not my fault because I'm just a part of this algorithm and the environment formed me and all that. But your friends, the people that you have around you, that it's, you created them. So by you leading with, oh, like me because I have this sweet car, like me because I have this, like that's me because I have, have that. Like, <laughs> that's the people you'll have. I mean, you. like what? Like, welcome to L.A. You know, L.A. is. F- yeah. How the hell do you live in L.A.? By the way, you're so opposite of L.A. <laughs> I needed you to gotta be a fish out of water. I there. went to L.A. because I, you know, come from like nature, stony meccas around. You know, so I lived in Boulder, Colorado, and then been Oregon and Hawaii for a while and. Um, did a bunch of traveling in between that. And I felt as though the way that I describe LA is LA is like an oven. You know, so you go to the other places in the world and you gather your ingredients and you make a pizza and you see, so you put it and you get it all sorted out and it's a nice circle and you got the pepperonis or whatever. Maybe it's vegan. And then at some point, <laughs> be politically correct. Some, <laughs> exactly, you know, yeah. There's the LA. Yeah. 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 I'm afraid. Yeah. I'm like, I'm withdrawn. <laughs> I, um, I picked up on that right there. Yeah. Could, could I, be, it could be, I, vegan. could be vegan. Could be vegan. Could be vegan. Could be vegan. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Don't judge me. Plant-based but pepperoni. <laughs> but at some point, my sensation, which may or may not have been accurate, was like I need to I need to put the pizza into the oven. And so you know, I I drove my car down to the oven. I've been there for the last four years, and now I have you know the book, and I have the online program, and I, the podcast has grown. Don't leave the pizza know. in there too long. I was going to say, but you don't want to leave the pizza in too long. And so now I'm planning on moving to uh, Texas, Austin, Texas, for oh, uh, for a short amount of time. California is losing everybody. I swear to Dude, God, dude, it's nothing but for lease signs. Like around my neighborhood, yeah. like every block, it's just like for lease, for lease. It's, it's almost down there. Right? It's like sad and almost like an interesting game in a way. We're gonna see another for lease sign. I get this weird do- dopamine hit. I'm like, whoa, another one. Wow, because I'm not a, a landowner in LA, so I'm like, whatever. Um, you know, and I, 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 I own a place in a more rural setting in, in Bend, Oregon. So my individualistic perspective is like, as people surge out of these places, they're going to go to like nicer, more so, rural type spots. So, so Aaron, you live living in the, the mm-hmm. secular capital of the world next to probably Vegas, right? Do you, yeah. do you feel there is a, a healthy balance of some of these things, right? We talked, we, you alluded to the Lamborghini, yeah. um, and you know, Sal's alluded to us chasing pleasure and, and getting things for the hedonistic value. You know, can we, can we be in pursuit of, of growth and being a healthy person and also uh, find ways to uh, allow some of those things to uh, come into your life, or is it all bad? I think it comes back to the same response is, are you consumed by the game, or are you able to have like more of a witness role of the game? Right. If you're in that position, it doesn't matter what you do, in my opinion, because you're not consumed by it. You know, you could be consumed by any game. You know, if you think that, 
you know, all you are is, I mean, there's some games that would probably be better if all you are is a father or all you are is this or that. But even within that, you can step back and observe and say, oh, wow, I'm, I'm playing this human game here. You know, and so I think that it's, it's, you know, it's like religion, you know, it's like because you were raised in this specific culture with this specific book, um, to, in my perception, it doesn't mean that that book is true. It's just the one that you happen to have been dropped into. So within that religion, are you able to gather the tools and the benefits from that religion or from that perspective or city or whatever, um, but not just identify entirely with it because you, you you're not that i think the person uh, it, how depending on how healthy they are and i mean that in the full sense they that's what determines the things that they chase and the things that they want so it, in the sense i what you're saying is true it doesn't matter what you're doing but who you are changes what you're doing and you won't be doing it's certain chicken, things. It's chicken or the egg. Right. It goes back to the same well, thing. Well, some things so, right? I, I mean, I, I, I kind of I subscribe to what you're talking about here, and I, I really feel like that. It comes back to the awareness thing, right? You keep alluding to the witness thing. I, I think yeah. that is just self-awareness. Is yeah. that I'm aware that this is a materialistic thing. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm aware that it, I, it is not me. It doesn't make me anything. But I can also say, like, Boy, is it fucking fun to drive? Fuck yeah! You know, boy, and that's is it, dope. boy, is it cool how it corners? You know, what I saying? think yeah, be LeBron James. Just don't drink your LeBron James Kool Aid. <laughs> like, do everything you can to play that game well. Yeah, and realize that this is a this is just just that. Right. You know, and then from there, I have got no hate for you know hate for the player. You know, it's like. <laughs> You know, it's like, damn, he plays the game well. Right. That's great. Right. But does he think that he is that shoe moving around the board right. to use you know, Monopoly? Right. You know, it's like, do you really, you really think you're the shoe? It's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm the shoe because I'm winning. Yeah. You know, and then all of a sudden you lose hard and you're like, I'm not this shoe. And you go through some form of existential crisis where you have to analyze yourself deeper. And now maybe all of a sudden you become, you know, born again, something, right. you know, you start to really come out and say, God, I was never the shoe. I was, it was bigger than this. The whole, man, I needed some, some figure. Maybe I, I mm. choose to elect it, some figure in space, you know, some God figure, whatever it may be. Like that's, that's the leader. It's taking me home. But before I thought I was the shoe my whole life because I was winning the game. Right, Not right. even realizing you're the sock. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Within the shoe. Hey, it's, it's, hey, it, it's interesting. I don't, you know, what, whether you subscribe to a religion or you speak it like universe, it's pretty wild how that lesson it is taught. Yeah. It will be taught it at be one taught. point. Oh yeah, at it's one, all it's, spir- it's physics. It's yeah. spiritual wisdom. Yeah, and it, it, it's it, spiritual it, physics. I think it, it's really it's like there's a science to it. It's the same way that people are built up in culture to be torn down. You get to a certain level where all of a sudden it's like wow. I mean, there's a handful of comedians right now that that um, I've I'm one of which I'm 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 fairly close with. It's going through kind of like the whole, all the stuff of like Mm. me too and all that stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's such an interesting thing to watch the development, you know, watch the, is it, they grow, 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 grow. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, now you're, you're in position. The trees are so much taller. It's, you could see it from miles away. Now you have, there's like, there's something scientific about it of all the rest of the nodes. I think will have the tendency of like, how can we, chop that thing yeah, back yeah, yeah. down because if that's down then I'm up <laughs> and it's like there's some equilibrium thing that happens with it mm-hmm. and so we seek out to be at that point and then eventually some people play the game well enough that they arrive at that point and then very often they resent that point see I, I find it interesting that you know science wants to prove it that it's it's some physiological thing that happens or that we can break it down scientifically and then spiritually we want to just attribute it all to God there's got to be something there, and I feel like I, I, no matter which one you subscribe to, it's a religion. Mm-hmm. Everything know? is right. science well, is one of the biggest religions. You, yeah, well, scientism is yeah. a, is a very dangerous, obviously, religion. Yeah. It lacks uh, morality. It's purely objective. Right, right. You become it, it, p- computer. Well, it asks. It doesn't ask. Should I? It always says, "Can I?" Right. Oh, let me see. Yeah, it's not a should. You know, I, let's see if we can. That's always the question. I think you have to look at different lenses uh, to, to understand different types of wisdom. It doesn't make sense to use science to understand art or poetry. It doesn't make sense to use... We sure try to, though. We do. It doesn't make sense to use religion to understand science. Uh, religion and spirituality has its own wisdom. 
Um, and they're all, look, you know, if you believe in evolution, you have to believe in the evolution of ideas. And if things stick around a long time, it's because it's probably valuable. Yeah. There's probably some wisdom in there. If something's been around for a long time, don't just throw it out. Ask yourself, uh, why, is, why have people found this particular thing valuable for as long as they have? Uh, because it's, it's gone through a lot of different people who, you know, and com- com- combining them all is definitely going to be smarter than you. Find the wisdom with that. Don't just cut it out. Yeah, on all that, I think it comes back to like the same thing, ancient wisdom, you know, having polarities, yin and yang and light and dark and sun and moon, east, west, science, you know, whatever the other ism right. is, science, scientism and whatever other ism, mm-hmm. it's more like a holistic, more artistic, more, you know, expressive mm. You know, so you, you said it with, if we never were, were instructed how to deliver a baby, we would naturally figure it out, obviously. Mm. You know, and so it's one of those things where it's like we have the scientific flashlight from a Western person that grows up indoctrinated into the world that we have. It feels comforting to be able to come back and say, don't worry, everything's been defined, everything's been measured, we have a scientific term for There's that. There's that arrogance, you know? Yeah, it's like, mm-hmm. don't worry, we understand, we've, we've put the definition on it, we got the DSM, you've got the the ADHD, and you're like, oh, okay, I got the ADHD, great. <laughs> don't worry, we got a drug for that. <laughs> great, 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 you got a drug? Okay, cool, okay, good, 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 we're good. You know, and then beyond that, it's like, so that's the more scientific realm, it's great. I'm glad that we have pharmaceutical drugs. I'm glad that we have surgery. I'm glad that we have all of that stuff. Behind that, it's like, well, how do you define and confine and delineate, um, you know, say someone playing a a violin that's making people weep in a subway in Paris? You're like, what's the science there? It's like, well, you see that that, that the song, it it struck some chord in the amygdala. It's just like, shut the fuck up. (laughs) Listen to the song. Doesn't yeah. need definition. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. You, you're not going to solve. You're not, you're not going to solve uh, spiritual illness with uh, with medicine. Just like you're not going to solve a bacterial infection with art or yeah. whatever. And that's when this the science mind can become judgmental of that same person we referenced before that went to Peru and did the ayahuasca journey and all that stuff. And then, but there's a lot of missing pieces that science hasn't completely classified yet. Uh, but perhaps in five years, maybe we might create some definitions for that. Interesting book, uh, Derek Thompson's Hitmakers. Have you read that before? No. Oh, so that you'll appreciate that for this conversation. Just the, we're talking about the science of art and music, and that book makes the case for that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Read it. It's a good. It's an interesting read. You know, I, I mean, it, it's it, it, it contradicts what I think what we're saying and what we believe. But they, I mean, they believe that you can scientifically break down all that. I yeah, I think everything. It's I I, I describe science as. It's like you're in a car and you're driving down a dusty road and your experience in the car just mobbing down and switching gears. That's art. You're just in the moment. You're feeling it and you're like, I hit the jump and whatever, maybe a power slide, you know, and then behind that, that artistic expression that just felt authentically, it was like, I was like moved by something. It just came out. I don't even know how to explain it behind that. Once the dust starts to settle with time, you can have the scientists and the nerds coming up behind, nothing against nerd, mean nerd in an endearing way. They come up behind and they, they're analyzing the tire tracks and they're analyzing the type of rubber that was used. And, right. and it's this very dry, sterile kind of definitive, okay, this is what happened. We've got it. You put it into the books. It's like, yeah. hey, we have some science about that <laughs> rad experience. <laughs> it reminds like, me of trying to, it, trying to break down flow state, right? Like that's exactly. how it is. Like when you have athletes and people that have been doing this for, you know, decades and probably centuries of, you know, doing things and they've been able to just drop into that without thinking about anything. And now we're trying to pick it apart and figure yeah. out how do we, how do we formulate but the, this? But the person in the car, it would be very easy for them to be like, you know, just write off. The, the nerd brigade falling behind and be like, ah, they don't know anything. You know, they're just, they're not even in the experience. Yeah. You know, and then the nerd brigade could be looking at the people in the car and they're like, they don't even understand the type of rubber in their tie. Like they don't know anything about this experience. Yeah. It's like, they're looking at almost two, it's like two different languages describing the same thing. And then they're having wars about it. It's that, like, that, what if we just team up and then, you know, I think that's how people. That reminds stronger. me of the potential consequences that I feel I see when I go to like a, a live sporting event now. And, you know, because I've been watching live sports for a very long time, I've watched this crazy evolution in the last like decade 
of where you saw none of this before and and then I watched a little bit of it and then more and more of it than the majority of it now like everybody when you're at it like a live concert or a live game has gone from being in the moment feeling the music feeling the game and and being so into the environment to uh, caring more about recording it through your phone so you could post it and share it on, on Instagram. They're watching the whole thing through their phone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah it's I, crazy. Yeah, I always, I always think about, like, what are the unintended consequences of that? Like, will they, will they uh, experience less joy yeah. because of that, or will they never get the fullest feeling of what that is like being almost one with that moment because they are so concerned about mm -hmm. sharing that with well, others? It's just a, they're just in a different medium. You know their medium as opposed to being absorbed by the the sound and being with the people and all that. Th th their medium is capture. I want to capture, and I'm looking into the screen, and you know even inherently looking into the screen as opposed to utilizing panoramic vision. You know your eyes are an extension of your brain, and the way that you use your vision, if you're narrowing in your focus, that goes back into you know say I'm pulling a bow back and I'm focusing all my energy into that one prey that's out there. I, you know I get my proper cocktail of cortisol and stress hormones and I'm really focusing like a shark versus say I take in the whole panoramic vision, which is Andrew Huberman, Dr. Andrew Huberman. He's like the, he reviewed my whole chapter about this, thankfully, because I had all sorts of errors and he was like, this is how it actually should be written. <laughs> um, and so he's, he's like, he's a, a researcher up in Stanford, which is Stanford's like right beside here, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he's, he's back and forth through here. Have you done a podcast with him? No. Mm -hmm. Okay. It would be really great for you guys to have him. Cool. On. Introduce he's, us. he's like one of the, the smartest humans, and his perception of the way that our visual muscles inform our autonomic nervous system is is brilliant. You know, and so when you go into taking in that that panoramic view of the whole entire, you know, you're watching the, you know, all the crowd and you're watching you know, maybe it's an outdoor concert and mm -hmm. clouds or all that, it literally informs the nervous system that you're in a more open, flow, calm, receptive place. When you narrow your vision in, you organize your nervous system to more executive function, get shit done, I'm here to capture. Oh, that's interesting because do you remember when we theorized about this, Sal? Mm -hmm. We talked about this on the podcast about the experience you have when you go somewhere like Yosemite. Uh-huh. And, changes you. And, you. and you have this kind of, why do we all have this breathtaking moment? It's just rocks and trees and sky. Yeah, yeah you can look at it in a picture. Right, but exactly. But why when you go there? And I, we theorized that it had something to do with uh, really at that moment recognizing how small you are in comparison to something so the grand. The scale is overwhelming. But yeah. what you're saying is a little bit different than that. That's very interesting. It's both. Me. Yeah, that's interesting. So, it, so first it, it, it puts you into a place of receptivity. And then, uh, and then that allows those pots, those pots, those thoughts to start to kind of stir <laughs> up in that cauldron. Mm. But first you need to be in a receptive place. So if you were just watching Yosemite on a screen, you're seeing the same image, but it's not nearly going to hit you in that visceral way. You know, and that's because literally it's like you, you first are opening the container through those visual muscles slash everything else that sounds, it's, you're, you're being enlivened, you know, and so in our modern day where you're taking all of those potential, have you guys hunted ever? I have when I was younger. Been, so, so, so I went bow hunting for the first time last summer in, in uh, Maui, Hawaii. And as I was out there, it's this insane sensation, like literally like all the cliche things, like feeling like more alive than I ever had and all that stuff. Uh, it was quite true because I was being forced to have this sense of, sound and wind and you know everything like behind me to the left i was measuring distances okay cool like that bush is 20 yards and you know taking my my range by that bush is 30 yards that bush is 50 yards you know so i'm literally like just by me just posting up here i'm i'm enlivening my brain it's like a, like an electrical storm inside my mind to be able to cast a net in my environment and like become the environment mm. Whereas when you just put all of that information of that moment into some like bow hunting special on TNT, <laughs> you're like, eh, like you're kind of dying in a way. Wow. If, if, if the reference point, the other side of the spectrum was becoming enlivened by your environment. Right. I think capturing all of that, putting it into a screen and calling that your, your life. I think that would you know be kind of the opposite. Always an interesting time hanging out with you, dude. Yeah, thanks for coming, bro. Yeah, yeah man. Yeah. Yeah, 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 it's always a good time. How long are you in the area for? Uh, I don't know. A few more hours. Oh, I flew out here, just, here huh? just for this. Yeah. Oh, hey. 
That's yeah. great. I was yeah. trying to double it up with an. I'm coming up here again in like three days, and uh, I've been trying to stay with my word. I think that's a very important thing. It is. And so we appreciate it. And so uh, I think in general, it's a huge, it's a huge deal. So, gets into, so now you're going back to the oven. Yeah. Well, don't I bur- leave the don't oven. Don't burn your I'm vegan pizza. Leave, so here's, so here's the plan. Hopefully we can come back and do another podcast, assuming this plan goes through because I'll have stories. Um, and I'd love to have you guys back on mine and all that, all For that sure. stuff. I'll probably co-release this if you guys permit it or something. No, let's do that. We'll, we'll, yeah, we'll that's figure fine. it out. But the plan next spring uh, would be to have a whole bag of new stories because this winter, the plan, um, you know, world permitting, is to go out to Papua New Guinea and Tanzania and Sri Lanka and all sorts of places that people have been kind of living the way that they've been living for for lots of years um, and be able to have a more real, visceral, anthropological perspective of what the hell has been going on in our bodies for thousands of years. And then that would be the beginnings of, of book number two. Oh, I'm excited for that, dude. Right on. I hope. World permitting. We'll see what the heck's happening in the yeah, world. I know. Yeah, I know. But I appreciate you guys so much having me here. This Thanks, is the, brother. This is the, the first interview. Since, yeah. yeah, since... Physical uh, yeah. interview. We haven't That's had anybody crazy. here since the pandemic started. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How is that? I know we need to wrap up. How has that affected you guys not having in person versus doing remote? Well, luckily for us, our podcast uh, episodes with just us do the best, yeah. and we we have each other, so oh, we're right. able to build this. The brand interviews around. haven't been as good, right? Typically, right? We have some interviews that do very very well, um, and we enjoy it. I love meeting people, um, but it hasn't hurt us business wise from well. a from a personal per, you know perspective. It, I like being around people, and it does suck that you know it's the, the way things are right now, and it's a bit difficult to to work through. But um, but yeah, we're open back up. We had we started with you. That's great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thanks I am, for coming I'm on, man. Honored to be here. Really appreciate spending time with you guys. Thanks, brother. Thank you. Great way to progressively overload in a time when people are, or weights are scarce. Totally. Yeah. It's hard. So many people are having a hard time getting plates or getting weights. It's like you could, we, we always, I think that's like the default. And that's, and tra- trainers are just as guilty. I am too. Of like when I first started training, like you always just think like more reps, more sets, or more weight. Mm-hmm. Like this is how, like we're going to get better. We're going to keep.